We are starting the regular meeting now at 4.30. And not, we are not going into a special meeting and then into a closed meeting. So um, going forward, and so we're gonna, we're gonna play with this a little bit. The first few of these is gonna be a bit of a challenge, no doubt, but we will um, get through it as we get used to the um, new uh, order. So we will have a recess for dinner and then the meeting will continue after dinner. There will not be a restart of yet another meeting at that um, time. So let's get started and see how it uh, and see how it goes. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. And the Aboriginal acknowledgement: We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Tanaha, the Silix, and the Sinix peoples, and is home to the Métis and many diverse Aboriginal persons. We honour their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. At this time, we'd also like to take a moment for us to reflect on the tragic accident of last week, where one of our Nelson Police Department officers was um, unfortunately um, uh, died and his colleague uh, is, um, was injured. And so I'd like to recognize the passing of Wade Tittemore and to express that our thoughts are with his wife, Cheryl, and his sons, Seth and Devin, at this time. And to let you know that um, there's been a lot of in inquiry about, uh, about his funeral and the services. His funeral is tomorrow. It is a private family occasion with invited guests only. Um, doesn't mean that we don't want to keep um, his family uh, in our hearts and minds tomorrow. I will be attending on behalf of City Council and as chair of the uh, police board. For those that uh, want to send condolences, we do have a condolence page open at the City of Nelson at, at condolences at nelson.ca. And please also consider that you can continue to donate to both um, uh, Constable Timore and to Constable Notley through the uh, GoFundMe page that's been set up for these two families and uh, also through the Police uh, Foundation um, is another place that you can make a donation. We also want to keep uh, Matt, Constable uh, Nole, in our thoughts. He continues to be in hospital in uh, critical condition. So if I could have a moment just so we can reflect on these uh, two uh, young men. Thank you. Moving on in the you know, on the agenda. So item number three is the introduction of a late item. So we're gonna we're gonna try that. So it's new 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 year, <laughs> new tries. So I'd like to add to uh, the discussion regarding the call for nominations for uh, to the FCM board for council consideration to late items. Um, and I would also like to request that council move the discussion of the late item from number 16, so at the end of our meeting, to uh, number eight um, on our agenda, which is, which is recess, so it's like seven and a half <laughs> <laughs> on the agenda. It'll come after we have um, the council reports and before we recess. Uh, the addition of a late item requires a vote of council uh, to have it added to the agenda, just in terms so everybody understands what the process there is. So, um, can I have a mover of the uh, late item? It's been moved and it's been seconded, moved by Councillor Tate, seconded by Councillor Pinero. Great, and all those in favor of the late item? And that's carried. Okay, so then going on to item four, the adoption of the agenda as amended. Is there a mover? Moved by Councillor Woodward, seconded by Councillor Tate. All those in favor of the agenda is amended, moved, and carried. Number five, adoption of minutes of the previous meeting. Do we have a mover? 
Councillor Woodward, seconded by Councillor Lockenberg. Any irregularities, omissions, or errors that were noted in review of the minutes? Seeing nobody jumping up, I'll take it that they're good. All those in favor? And that is also carried. And moving on to item number six, the city manager's verbal report. Um, the city manager remains on vacation, but in his place, uh, Chris Jerry has been acting as the acting CAO. And do you have anything that you would like to report or report on, on in your department? <laughs> um, not really at this time. You know, we're still going through our budgeting process, so we're getting a lot to spend a lot of time together, and we'll see you again on Friday to talk about public works and um, uh, our equipment manager will be here and we'll also have a presentation from um, MFA BC which will come and talk about um, investments and funding and that sort of thing so um, that's kind of where my focus has been recently of course and uh, you know looking forward to oh, uh, was that the MFA piece? MFA. Uh, Municipal Finance Authority <laughs> BC. You know what yes. it is. Yes for sure yep so there are um, you know, if we want to borrow any funds, there are, 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 you know, basically our, our bank, I suppose, for financing. Um, so they'll do a presentation on, on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, looking forward to getting our city manager back. Excellent. Excellent. So moving on to item seven, council reports. And so... This is just, it's gonna be our first try at these. We're gonna see how it, all, how it all flows out. These aren't strictly necessarily to be on the fact that you're gonna report out on, you know, I went to meeting X because I sit on that committee. It can be, it can also include other activities that you've participated in in the, the city or where you've represented the city. And because most of what we do has some tie back to um, economic activity or sports activity or cultural activities in the city. And I think it's just a nice overview for people to also know that, that we don't just sit here around the, the table, that we're residents um, and participants in the city of Nelson as well. And because it's usually a bigger um, report, I'm gonna start with uh, Councillor Page to report out because uh, in his report, he'll have <coughs> any updates he'd like to give us on the uh, Regional District of Central Kootenai. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have a few things here. so. Uh, we did get some correspondence from the sports community and I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the recent passing of Buck Crawford. Uh, Buck was a beloved former player and community coach in Nelson. Uh, he was a true teammate, teammate known for his kindness, his humility and his love for life. And he will, will be deeply missed by his family and many friends, as well as the countless young hockey players he mentored and inspired. So I wanted to take a moment here, too, to also honor his passing and its effect on our sports community. And our thoughts go out to his family and friends. Um, on to the more business side uh, of our recreation component, the service establishment bylaw has been approved by the ministry uh, within the service review for Rec Commission 5 and will be uh, at Thursday's board meeting for final adoption, which will set us upon the new foot that we've been working on for the last number of years with recreation, with uh, renewed, renewal con renewed rural and urban consent within that service, which will allow us to move forward with how we manage, develop, and plan for our recreation services in the area. Um, the board will also be voting on Thursday on the approval of a terms of reference for that RDCK staff have bought, brought forward at recreation to work with the City of Nelson staff on uh, basically a terms of reference and a plan of engagement on how we do a coordinated plan for the campus site. So who's in charge of what, where, why, how do we engage on new initiatives, and how do we come up with a holistic plan that takes into consideration the hybrid, uh, the hybrid situation down there, which we covered at recreation, but for those of us who were not there, uh, that will be work that we will be tackling in 2023, uh, board willing. Um, there's been a number of orientation sessions. Uh, even just recently this afternoon, I was at the housing orientation session for the implementation plan at the RDCK. But the big pieces I would pick out from our last board meeting is that the BC Transit issues are 
well understood, well known in terms of cancellation and service delivery. Uh, we are aware that the the, the board uh, was informed that the contractor out there is working uh, to uh, update and bring and standardize the union agreement that's out there. So there's, there's an inherited union agreement. It's having impacts on compensation that's possible. And they are working through that right now to get to a place where uh, recruitment can be effective and, and service delivery can be uh, repaired. Um, the other big thing, we did get a letter from Joint Resource Recovery or from the RDZK warning us of a potential 10% increase in tipping fees. Uh, our our more, most recent Joint Resource Recovery with the budget numbers updated, it will be in fact be very close to that 10% tipping fee, uh, all hopes aside. But that that is going through. Um, and then we are also advocating to the province at the RDCK side uh, for, for consideration for consideration of the rural impact of some of the changes Recycle BC is putting in place in terms of things that must be accepted, mattresses comes to mind, uh, and uh, what kind of impact that has on a, a disparate, uh, on a very spread out community and, and what the travel impact and costs associated with that are. So we're, we're advocating for that. And then I think those are all the highlights, unless there's any questions. Any questions for Councillor Page regarding the RDCK? Looks like you're safe to go ahead. If you've got anything else that you'd like to talk about. That's it. <laughs> okay. So thank you for that. Um, I do have a question to maybe staff or, well, I guess it's just a question. And perhaps uh, Director Jerry will just make a note of it. In terms of the changes to Recycling BC changes, <coughs> they're taking more um, items and that's going to, I mean, that, that's going to affect if you take your stuff down to the um, transfer station. But I'm wondering whether or not we're going to be looking at any um, notification going out to our actual residents about additional things that they can put in their um, blue box because that, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're into recycling, you're reading the recycling bulletin. But if you're just you know, like the average person, you're just doing what you're doing. And I'm just wondering if we could um, maybe hear uh, from works or during, uh, as we ongoing with budget discussions and presentations that they might be able to touch on, on that in terms of uh, getting that information out uh, to citizens that there are some other things that we can put into the blue boxes. We wanna make sure that we're also putting the right things in the blue box because when contamination levels get too high, it damages um, our ability to continue in the in the program so um more in but more in of the right stuff this is going to be uh um is going to be Im important and and uh thank you uh councillor page for talking touching on about uh about crawford he was a old uh well-known uh, friend of my family and yes you're right he will be he will be missed and um transit issues have you had a Meeting Council Walker? No, okay, so. But I do have something to say on transit. Okay, so when we get to your report, then that, okay. So, no, those are my questions. Can I comment on that? Um, so, uh, of course, we're going to have um, Colin Innes and Charlie Henderson here on Friday so we can ask them these kinds of questions, so that'll be great. Um, also, it's good timing because we're sort of prepping our water, uh, sewer, and um, resource recovery invoices that will go out to each uh, household. So there's lots of options there. We can put an insert in with that. Um, we're going to have a space on there. Uh, for a QR code, um, seems to be kind of popular these days, but that'll take people to a page where we're going to have a whole bunch of information on what's going on with recycling, what's going on with um, organics, so we can put lots of information in there. So opportunities to kind of get the word out to the public uh, coming up pretty soon. Excellent. Excellent, just as long as we're staying on top of that. Um, I'm going to go next to, uh, maybe we'll cover a follow piece. I'm going to go next to Councillor Payne. Okay, this is my first run at this, guys, so hopefully I get the, got the knack of it. So the Cultural Development Committee has met a couple of different times, and it's really exciting to be a part of that group because they have, um, like many other organizations around town, been hit hard through COVID, but are uh, bouncing back and being really innovative about 
um, how they're doing that. If anyone was able to attend the David Dovey, Dopey exhibit at the Capitol, you'll understand that they are uh, pulling out all the stops. And the level of creativity that we have in this community is just uh, breaking the boundaries. The one other thing I want to mention is that the NCTS, otherwise known as the Nelson Civic Theatre Society, um, did a presentation at the last uh, CDC meeting where they had, oh, and I should have written down his name because I can't remember, but he did a presentation on the work that he's been doing uh, throughout the Kootenays to attract more of the film-based industry to leave the coast and come up here to this beautiful area uh, where they did just complete a movie in Fernie. So lots of opportunities abound there. And um, through the Nelson Civic Theatre Society, we have a very active uh, participant working to bring those here. Other exciting things going on, but I'll just move on to uh, the Housing Committee, which is getting back on the rails after a bit of a hiatus. Very excited about some of the opportunities. As you know, it's a pretty critical issue here in our fair city and in the uh, district in general. Lots of partnerships and collaborations coming forward there. The last thing I want to mention, maybe a little more social, it's my neighborhood has come to life around what I consider, again, around what I consider to be a foundational part, uh, formerly known as Burrell's, now the Uphill Market, opened to um, excited crowds on Saturday, and they, in my opinion, are doing a spectacular job. So again, uh, opening a, a new business in this environment just to me demonstrates the strength of local support that Nelsonites have um, really helped, I feel, the business community navigate a lot of the challenges that we've seen. And I hope it's just upwards and onwards from there. Uh, in my opinion, they make a very fine latte. So if you have not been there yet, uh, please drop in. There's seating. There'll be outdoor seating in the summer and lots of uh, neighborhood grocery items, including the candies that um, I'm sure the Trafalgar students will be discovering and devouring very quickly. Okay. I don't, I don't want to put too many people on the spot, <clears throat> but I'm going to go over here just because I, I, I know, um, sorry, <coughs> Councillor Panero, I know that you've been away, but um, love to hear a report on how Nelson Athletes um, went and where you went to um, in December. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, as the mayor was saying, I'm, to me, uh, these first couple months, I told myself I was not going to talk much and just kind of keep my head down and try to absorb as much as possible because it's new for me. And so I'm going to stick with that. But uh, I was, I have gone to additionally um, one library board meeting so far, um, along with Leslie, and, and it was very informative. Um, Again, just getting my feet under me, underneath me and understanding the processes, but uh, really exciting to see the opportunities that they have there and, and what they're offering for the community. And um, yeah, and as far as my other other life, so we uh, I'm the head coach of the provincial boxing team, and we were able to go to Mazatlan, uh, Mexico, in December and compete against. Uh, a bunch of Mazatlan, uh, Culiacan, and Tepic, sort of three different cities in Mexico and Sinaloa, and uh, against their national and state champions. And so we took 18 athletes down there, and three from Nelson, and uh, our Nelson athletes did amazing in that setting and, and um, really stepped up. I think it was the, the great thing about that opportunity for us, I think, is coming from a small town and and, and a bit of a bubble in so many different ways. It's nice to see our young people step out into the world a little bit and engage with people where they have something in common um, and and excel, honestly, and, and, and step up to the plate and, and be successful in that setting. It's, it's nice to see, and it's nice to see that we're capable of that and from a small town and, and to 
see uh, our young people expanding their minds and, and putting themselves in, in a different cultural and, and, uh, and a different setting, basically. And so that was really nice to be a part of. And it's nice to be home, sort of. <laughs> I, I, I recall there. when you came home and they, we had the first meeting the day after you got back. You yeah. were in here with your parka on. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a bit of a shock. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councilor Pinero. And, and I look forward to um, updates as I know that because of your involvement as a national, uh, in the provincial coaching and with the national team that we'll get to hear some more updates and about uh, hopefully more of our local athletes doing well in these uh, national and international competitions. So I look forward to that going forward. Um, Councillor Tate, maybe, do you have anything that you'd like to report out on? Uh, not at this time. I did attend the Rec Commission, and uh, Councillor Page filled us in on that already. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak for Councillor Tate, who, who forgot that she organized a, a, a hockey tournament um, <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Um, and she did a, a, a fine job of that. But what I really want to recognize there is the... Uh, once again, you know, we always talk about uh, shop local, and I, I went to w watch some of the tournament. I had friends that were here from Penticton, and you know, there's an economic impact of how many teams come into into town, and you know, they're here for uh, a weekend, and they're staying that at was hotels. And thirteen teams and two hundred and ten players. Thank you. See, I didn't get to give her. I didn't get to send her. Like, I got a, a few of you guys. I sent a little note to say, don't forget you're giving council reports, but she'll she'll cotton on now. But I went, and I, of course. Because you, because you do. I, I entered the 50/50, and I entered. They had these fantastic baskets, and so my point of wanting to talk about it is, is that I was fortunate enough to actually win a basket. But all of these baskets, my basket was probably valued at well over $300, and there was at least 10 baskets on that table. I would say, all put together and all stuff from local businesses. And again, that reminder that shopping local is important because I didn't see Amazon with a basket. Um, and so it's important to uh, support people and, and, you know, to say thank you to uh, these community people that, that put, you know, give their products and their time and give certificates um, to these tournaments that we hold and, and have opportunity like that because it really does show um, how much how much support is, is given um, in the in the city and yes I I won the pampered princess basket <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I'm getting to have a whole day at the spa so, <laughs> anyhow mm -hmm. um, thank you and thank you for um, volunteering to do that uh, work the feedback was uh, great that I heard from the participants that I knew that had come over from Pantech so uh, Councillor um, Woodward or Lockwood any um i can go sure <clears throat> so just uh one thing i um as many of you know the um transit's been suffering certainly the regional transit system has been suffering um the contract the rdck has with next gen transit services has has struggled with the um the lack of of bus drivers um and so there's been a lot of, especially over the holidays, there were quite a few missed routes, people stranded on the side of the highway and, and so on. Um, so it, this sparked um, a community group um, to form to begin advocating for a better transit system. And so they reached out to me as the member of the West Kootenai Transit Committee to have a meeting just to talk about solutions. And uh, it was very constructive and, and the vision um, is connected to a broader movement across the province to create a regional or inter-regional transit system so that you could effectively take a bus from say Nelson to Vancouver and back or certainly from Nelson to Cranbrook to get to services there. Um, it's um, in addition to that one of the things that they'll be looking for is um, an on-demand transit service which has had some success in, in communities, a few communities in BC and certainly more communities around the country. Um, On-demand transit is essentially using your phone or I guess some would you'd be able to call in, but it essentially puts you into, uh, into a queue and so the route gets redirected. So it's not like a taxi service, it's more like uh, a dynamic routing system. So it can start to pick people up closer to their home 
more on the time when they need it. It's pretty exciting and um, as an idea. Um, and it's and it, it makes sense that this is one of the asks of this community group. I expect we'll be hearing from them more. It was just sort of a first meeting. Um, but uh, something to for us, I think, to consider or think about in terms of our own planning about what uh, what we want to do to upgrade transit. Um, we, uh, you know, transit's one of those things, as many of you know, that there's tipping points within it. That if um, if you're if you're starting to miss routes, then people become disillusioned with it. They stop choosing that as a transportation solution which then means less ridership, which means less investment, and, and it kind of sets it into a death spiral. On the other side, if you can get it going, maybe take some initial investment up front, you can set it onto a positive uh, feedback loop or a positive spiral where it becomes a choice for young people who then carry that choice of trans of transportation solution into their teenage years or adulthood. Um, so just wanted to share that and I, like I said I expect to hear we'll hear more from them and from uh, the West Kootenai Transit Committee when they have their first meeting uh, sometime in the next month or two hopefully that's it thanks Matt. yeah no thanks that's um that's really important and and hopefully they keep um, pressing particularly at the regional district yeah. table to get some of those changes made and, and hopefully you get a, a a meeting coming I know that in the last as I recall, in our last term, um, there was the issue of some changeover and with the contacts just even for BC Transit. Mm -hmm. And that made um, doing getting meetings up and organized and took took more time. And so there wasn't as many meetings as perhaps there should have been. <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. Over there the last will be years. a meeting on the 31st. Yep. Right. Excellent. Councillor Woodward, do you have anything that you'd like to report at this meeting? Um, I guess... Uh, I haven't been to uh, any uh, committee meetings yet. Um, I will be attending um, the chamber uh, monthly meeting coming uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the emergency management meeting uh, in the next week. Um, I, I will just say in my other life, I'm a, a food bank coordinator at the Nelson Community Food Center. And uh, I've been there uh, almost two years. And uh, the, big, uh, the big news for us is we finally completed our our, our industrial kitchen. <gasps> Congratulations. <Yeah. laughs> it took 10 months. I, it was it was pretty fascinating to see uh, uh, what it takes to actually develop an industrial kitchen in an older building. Uh, it's extensive and a lot of money. But uh, what is uh, available now is that we can actually produce uh, community dinners. We can actually uh, make food for the food bank. Uh, so today they were baking uh, 50 loaves of uh, sourdough, uh, and uh, and we can produce jobs. We, we get jobs to people in the community to do this work. Um, so it'll become a much uh, much more flexible situation um, uh, for the community for the Nelson Community Center there, Nelson, the food center. Um, so, uh, but the the. The fact of the matter is the need is high. Uh, we're servicing between 350 to 400 people a week. Um, and I'm really happy to do that work because uh, I know the need is great. Um, but it is surprising for a town our size. Uh, and, and I think you know that really um, is reflective of the cost of living, um, which is affecting everyone, of course, across the board. But uh, we live in an expensive town. Uh, housing is expensive. And um, so I'm glad to be there and doing that work, uh, but it is wonderful to see that kitchen up and running. So thank you. That's great. Um, okay. Councilor Payne, cause I have a question to you for you too. Oh, I don't have a question. I have something to add. So do you want to ask Okay. Me a I have a question. First? Yes. Um, and that's regarding the industrial kitchen. So I heard that, um, the food center itself is going to be putting that to a maximum amount of use. But I know one of the things that I've heard of in the past is that there isn't a lot of industrial, um, kitchen space available mm. um, in the area and I'm just wondering if for people who I don't know are making candy or like mm. I have I have a, a friend that makes donuts in Vancouver right. and she rents two times a week 
space in an industrial kitchen that's in a church right. um, to do to make her donuts that she then takes and sells at a weekend market. Right. Is there is there um, room for that where we would see some somebody perhaps that uses our Wednesday or Saturday market would be looking for industrial kitchen space? So the Nelson Community Food Center has a lease with the United Church uh, within a certain parameters of our operation times. Right. Outside of that, that would be up to the Nelson, the United Church. Okay. Um, okay. Because it's in their building and we lease from them. Right. Um, so that people, if anybody is interested in that, would have to communicate to the United Church office. So there is potential, though, given the fact that looking at how much space you guys might be using or time you're using, there could be still some time that would I, be for somebody to inquire. I, I can't comment on yeah. that. I don't know. Perfect. Um, so, but uh, we definitely use it uh, extensively at, at this moving forward. Um, so, but they'd have to contact the yep. United Church. No, nope, that's good. That's just a good piece of information for people to have because some people are only looking for a few hours, and it, that makes all the difference about whether or not they could start a little, yes. a little, uh, a little business. So, the, the church uses it too, right? right? They they have they yep. have uh, they have programming. Um, so there, so it's it's all it's a shared space. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, Councillor Payne, back to you. Uh, there is one thing I did want to add to the report, to my report, and that's I just really wanted to take a moment um, in the intervening time that we haven't been together. We experienced one of the coldest periods that we've ever seen in Nelson. And so for myself and probably everyone around the table, it was inconvenient, bigger parka, turn up the thermostat, a little more shoveling. As we know, to many individuals uh, who are more vulnerable, um, in our community, it became a bit of a life and death scenario. And I want to acknowledge the individuals and the agencies who really stepped up uh, to provide additional services so those individuals would be uh, fed and, and housed at a particularly difficult time. I think out of that, there's been a strong recognition that we do need to be more proactive going forward. And I know our own um, emergency operations are going to be involved in a task force to provide um, short-term and long-term, longer-term solutions, hopefully, because it seems like spring out there now, but generally the coldest day of the year uh, is in February. So winter is not over and that situation is is not behind us. And I just really want to acknowledge those agencies and many individuals who came forward as they so often do in Nelson. We're incredibly fortunate in that way. When the need is there, people come forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Um, so that leaves my report and I just uh, printed out my calendar because it's one of those things where you, you start this job and there, there is no job description in case anybody didn't didn't know that and uh, but you don't have just one boss you've got 12,000 bosses <laughs> um, so it's kind of it's kind of interesting but some of the things that uh, since starting and, and I think a lot of these are are just in introductory meetings that I've had with a number of people because it's a it's a new council new mayor um, so it was it was busy. It was busy in um, December. Uh, we had an initial meeting of the Nelson Health Campus, and just so people are aware, so we are gonna those are gonna be quarterly meetings that will be held, where Interior Health actually updates us on the status of the of the project and of the of the building of the long term care bed. So those will be uh, quarterly uh, quarterly meetings. Um, we've had a number of budget meetings as. Um, Director Jury has mentioned to us. Uh, there's also meetings, the interior health mayors and regional um, district chairs uh, get together for interior health and we get uh, to meet on key issues uh, that are in front of healthcare. I'm assuming that we will have one, we have one in December. I'm assuming that we should be having one hopefully this month that we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the decriminalization of, uh, of um, illicit drugs uh, that goes into effect in January uh, at the very end of the month. And so what processes and ideas they have around, uh, around that. 
Um, other things that have gone on are, I had an introductory meeting with uh, uh, all of the mayors in the area, I had a call with uh, Minister Ann Kang, who is the newly appointed uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs, where she was just basically doing um, introductions and discussing her mandate for municipal affairs, just so we would get to know, to get um, to know her. Um, I was fortunate enough at the beginning of January to um, swear in a new uh, recruit for the Nelson Police Department, Matthew Harris, who has now gone off to the um, Justice Institute for the next six months. We'll see him back in the community in June, where and I'm still getting my feet wet of our own policing, is uh, I think he comes back and he almost does like a practicum. So he's like a special constable when he comes back and he starts working and then he will go away a little bit again uh, to do a bit more training, but we're looking forward to him coming on. Some of you who, um, hopefully nobody here frequents the police station, but he had worked for us for, um, I believe, the previous 18 months as a, as a dispatcher. So right. he is familiar with the uh, organization. So if you've called in or you've dropped by for, for um, something, you may have actually um, met uh, Special Constable Harris. Uh, I met with uh, uh, Doctors uh, McBride and Merritt uh, earlier this month. Uh, they are the doctors representing uh, doctors and nurses for planetary health uh, to talk about um, our plan going forward in terms of implementation of Nelson Next. They are particularly interested in the move forward on um, electrification of uh, all new new bills and, and where we were in that. So I explained, I, I know that they've reached out to many of you around the council table for one-on-one -on -one discussions. Um, I had uh, Sebastian, the head of the Planning Development Services, as well as Cecilia, um, who's our expert on embodied carbon, um, in that meeting with me to uh, assure them that we are, are working on this and that we're glad that there are partners in the community that are interested in helping us in whatever way they can um, move forward uh, many of the concepts that are within the Nelson Next uh, document. So that was... Um, a great meeting. Also met with um, my first round of the Canadian Association of Police Governance Board. They meet quarterly as well, national um, uh, group that has uh, both RCMP and other kinds of police forces uh, trying to strive for uh, good governance in policing. We of course are we're not immune to the news. We know there's lots of controversy around policing and uh, and how they how they do their job. And as boards, it's important that we have the skills sets to, uh, to ensure that there's good governance happening at, at that level. So I look forward to continuing um, those uh, meetings. Uh, let me see here. Oh, lovely meeting with the Mount Saints. I got to get their name right. I made myself a note here. The Mount St. Francis Advocacy Group. They are a working committee of the Community Health uh, Co-op. And they're a group that have been really um, a real community group moving forward the concept of the um, health campus. We kind of discussed the fact that, that nobody really liked talking about the health campus, but we have to call it something. But around the development around Mount St. Francis and, and what's going on up there and sort of the idea of a, developing it into like a neighborhood, like having a neighborhood feel that it's just not a long-term care facility that's, that's up there, that mm. looking at what lands are there to be developed in the future? What lands do the city owns? What's, what's the relationship with the college? The concept of it being more like a village and being intergenerational. Looking at, can we put a variety of different housing up there? Can we make sure that there's young people, old people, and trying to develop a real community feel in that um, upper Fairview um, area? And they, again, are, um, have very positive outlook and they are willing to engage uh, with the city and help us um, as we go go forward with that. So another group that's uh, interested in, in uh, keeping, keeping in touch with uh, city council as we see things. And so they did have a couple of asks and that was around, you know, what land is up there that the city owns and uh, uh, Director Winton was with me at that meeting, and so we are, they had a couple of questions, and we are just getting them some information uh, regarding that. And I'm sure that if we, as time goes on here, that 
um, they'd be more than willing at any time to come and do a presentation to the cow. So anyways, they're, they're very, they were very excited and they just really wanted to come in and introduce themselves and make sure that, that we as city council and myself as the mayor knew, you know, where, where they had been and where they were um, hoping to go with their um, intergenerational uh, vision. Um, let's see here. I think, I think that's about it. Well, we've had the fire, very good presentations on Friday from fire and emergency management. And um, yesterday we had a wastewater workshop presented by um, Urban Systems that which um, gave us which gave us pause. And it just reminds me that you know, put the right waste in the right spot, and it's not normally the toilet bowl. But um, <laughs> um, it was an excellent presentation yesterday. And so, and today I was supposed to have a, actually Minister Kang was supposed to be here for a one-to-one -one meeting um, uh, with me today. And unfortunately her plans had been canceled. So we've had to reschedule, but I was really looking forward to that. And hopefully we can get that back on the books and have that uh, meeting about what, what uh, the city of Nelson can do to help the Minister of Municipal Affairs and what Municipal Affairs could do to help us as we move uh, forward over the next four years. So that is my report. Does anybody have any questions? Councilor Woodward. Um, do you know uh, any more about where they're at with the development of the health uh, campus up, uh, up of 10th Street there? Is, are things moving ahead? And oh, well, so we've, we've had, so we had a meeting in December was the first meeting that I had back in December the 7th, so after that last. So that's an update. And so um, Interior Health has promised us quarterly updates. And that's, uh, the people at that table, is a, it's quite a group. And they even asked us, like, are we, are we missing people? So there's, there's healthcare advocates there. Um, Debbie Zeban, who chairs this um, advocacy group, is there representing her group so that she listens to the information that's coming about the development there. And so we will be having those quarterly in terms of, I don't know if you've been up there lately, but there are a number of footings already in, so they are continuing to work full steam ahead on that. And at that meeting, you know, it was still going to be the 75 beds, but still the um, relocation of um, mental health and community health services up there and the, the daycare. And, you know, and that's, that, that made this um, advocacy group particularly happy because that helps with the intergenerational concept of development up there. And it's much needed in terms of making sure that we get those beds there. And that was actually on my, on my list is, you know, daycare is um, important in when I meet with, get the opportunity to meet with Minister Kang. Thank you. So. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. So, late item. So I did ask um, Sarah to uh, put on the table what the uh, what they're asking for. And basically, uh, this ask at the current time is for um, somebody to, for now, fill in the last uh, two meetings. I think there's two meetings left until the June meeting of the um, FCM where elections will be held uh, again. So the information's in front of you, and if you haven't had a chance to look at it, because you probably didn't know what was there, have a second to take, take a look at it. And just while everybody's reading, I'll just give it so that anybody that's listening um, can hear, and I'll just say what the eligibility criteria is in accordance with FCM's bylaws. British Columbia elected municipal office officials eligible to serve as directors on the FCM board of directors must, must meet the following criteria. criteria. They must be an elected off official of an FCM member municipality, of which Nelson is, from British Columbia. There's going to be a position that's open for a representative from one of the large municipalities, of which we're not. Um, but there's also uh, an opening for uh, vacant seat for uh, 
member at large is also available. And one of the things is that the, munis the member municipality that <coughs> is putting a member forward must be prepared to cover the costs of attendance at meetings of the board of directors. These meetings are in various locations around Canada, but mainly normally um, in the east because that's where FCM's main office is. The current remaining um, meetings are one that will be held in March in Durham, Ontario, and they are doing one meeting um, in May virtually and then the annual conference is in Toronto um, in late May. So discussion, council, there's no, there's no recommendation on the table um, because it's a late item, so recommendation would come from, from, from the floor. So. Mary, would you, <clears throat> should we, Put a recommendation now, or just have the discussion, and then, and then, depending, put a resolution. For I'm, what would you prefer? I am open to whatever the pleasure of council is. Well, I'd I'd be happy to share some some thoughts, and then if that leads to a resolution. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor. So through the chair, I've been uh, been thinking about this for a little while, and. Um, and have a perspective that I'd love to share with council about why we should do this. Um, so, you know, when we were elected, each of us, we, we didn't run for our own sake. We didn't run, what can this job do for me? In some ways I see this role as similar to that. It's not like, what can we, this job deliver to Nelson? It's really, it should be seen as what is Nelson's contribution to FCM. So really, it's, it, it, I just want to be clear, it should be, in my opinion, flip this script, like get on the board and start bringing goodies back to Nelson is probably not the best way to think about it. <coughs> it's our responsibility to the federal system uh, as a city. Do we have a responsibility? Well, every municipality does because the federal government delivers funding through the provinces to municipalities. And that funding is critical to our own existence as a municipality. Um, we can just let other municipalities carry the load, uh, or we can at some step up and, and say, you know, we'll, we'll for a period um, do our part to provide governance and, and vision to this organization. I think, the FCM, the role of FCM in the next decade, in this coming decade, I think is absolutely critical. The federal government has, in the last number of years, continued to invest in municipalities, but has also signaled that they want to do more, a lot more, and that critical to their climate action plan going forward will be billions of dollars of new investment to municipalities and local governments, billions. So. Um, FCM would be the conduit for that money. Now, how is that money spent? Depending on the representation of the board, which sets policy and vision for the organization, um, that money could be spent in all sorts of ways, you know, heavily into gray infrastructure or heavily into social services, on the other hand, or into climate resilience and adaptation. Um, I think that what Nelson's role in could be in, at that table is to bring essentially Nelson next and in and, and our sort of visionary climate action plan, which is a plan of low carbon resilience. It's a combination of reducing our GHG emissions while we bring um, our municipality to a better place to deal with climate effects. So more secure and, and stable. Now, that, that vision isn't necessarily unique, but how Nelson has chosen to implement it, and in some cases taken a, a, a little bit more risk-tolerant approach to it. I think of our work piloting the food cyclers. With, um, 
you know, FCM advocating for that kind of leaning into innovation, leaning into um, investment into municipalities to do take more of a leadership role as opposed to saying, oh, we'll do this at a national policy level or even at a provincial policy level, as opposed to saying, hey, municipalities, you are, you can be leaders, you are leaders. And a lot of the innovation, because you're so many different municipalities with so many different contexts, you're more likely to produce ideas that don't originate or from the, in the halls of Ottawa's bureaucracies. And I think that kind of voice and that kind of perspective that Nelson brings would be really well heard and would have an influence at that, um, at that table. FCM does spend time directly with ministers, directly with senior bureaucrats. And so the influence that FCM has over national policy, certainly as it relates to municipalities, is significant. It's really significant. So I think there's a, a role for Nelson to play in helping shape national policy. Now, Nelson's already done some of this in the last term. We led a coalition of municipalities to defend carbon pricing at the Supreme Court, and we were successful at it. So we've, we've shown that we can, you know, punch way above our weight, I think, and I think we can do more of that um, at FCM. Mm. And finally, I'd just say there is also in that role an opportunity to have insight or to help guide, um, you know, policy making and, and fundraising to the benefit of the city of Nelson. Um, in a small way, we saw some of that in the last term, which was um, because of our relationship with the federal government, when the Greener Homes program came down from, from the Ministry of Infrastructure, it had all sorts of challenges, and it really put Carmen and our team at EcoSave on their back feet as they tried to navigate this new program. Because we had that relationship with the federal government, I was able to make a phone call, speak directly with this, this senior minister or deputy minister or direct department head responsible for the Greener Homes program, and within a day had Carmen on the phone with their senior team for a two-hour call to restructure the program or to offer guidance, which then they took to restructure the program so it worked directly for, for Carmen and the team here. So those are the kinds of things that having that position at FCM could then turn around and deliver direct benefit back to the city. But I, again, I would say that's not the reason to do this. It's more of like, we haven't done it in a while. It's maybe a good time for Nelson to step up and do its part. Um, but there are, there are quite a few benefits that would, I believe, come back to the city. That's it from my perspective. Councillor Payne. Um, I just want to clarify, did we say at the beginning what FCM was? Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So we all know that. And the Federation of Canadian Mis Municipalities provides what for municipalities? It's, uh, the FCM is like the UBCM, the Union of British Columbia Municipalities, and it's an advo advocacy group. So they try to represent the interests of local government to, in this case, the federal levels of government versus where at UBCM it's to the provincial levels of government. So they are like advocacy or you could call them a lobby group um, so it is a, a, a relationship um, with a strategic partner and we are um, we participate with FCM not every community regional district or they don't call them we're the only province that has regional districts but but the similarity to a regional district in other provinces not not every province or every municipality um, participates um, with FCM. And how long has Nelson been a member of FCM? Long time. Long time. <laughs> Have we I ever had? You, I can tell you that that I went to an FCM can, um, meeting back in 2000 when I was on city council. So there's there's 22 years worth of Nelson being. Um, uh, member of, of FCM. And has there ever been a, a councillor from Nelson on 
the board before? Uh, uh, John uh, Dooley uh, was on the FCM board. Now, what I cannot actually answer for you unless I send some staff person off to look is that that was at the same time as that um, he was the mayor at that time. So Mayor Dooley took the seat as the regional director um, appointee. And so I am of the mind that he went as um, obviously the mayor of Nelson, but as the RDCK appointee to uh, participate. And so in terms of costs, those costs were picked up by the Regional District of Central Kootenai as opposed to the city of Nelson. And I would just add, we have Leah Main from Silverton, as, just for clarity for anyone else, uh, from the RDCK. Uh, as FCM board member and BC caucus chair. And we have Susan Hewitt, mayor of Caslow from the RDCK board, also on the FCM at present. With costs getting picked up by the RDCK. For both of them? Yep. Okay. But just to make it clear, uh, the costs, if we have someone from Nelson, would be borne by Nelson? Yes, yes. If we specifically take somebody from this table at this junction, we would be responsible for the, uh, the cost of that person would. participating. And, you know, and we do, so we, we pay for general services, so we, we are paying no. our, our share of the, because we're members of the. Just to complicate it. <laughs> just to complicate it. Uh, Leah Main was a director of the RDCK board, and so there, that was a big discussion uh, in December. Uh, because she's no longer, so the RDCK now has sent Leah as just a, a local councillor, or at least reaffirmed that they're still not that she's still the nominee, and that uh, they will continue to pick up her costs, even though she's no longer a board member, but that instead she's a representative coming from that local government area, and therefore bear the cost. Okay, that was a decision that you made at the RDCK table. Yeah. Is that, sorry, I just, want, I just need to follow up on that. So is that until the end of this term? Because the fact, so when this term ends in June, if she runs for election again and to be the, and also continues on as the BC caucus chair, then are you saying that Silverton would have to pick up her costs? I think we'd have to vote on it again. Or you'd have to we, vote on we it, ran it We ran it through to carry the term out since we were the nominee. Okay. We didn't set it into policy. Right. Thank you. Just to let you know that that's a thing that's happened. Councillor Tate. Hi. Does, uh, historically, do we have a procedure or a best practice of how we choose to nominate um, people from the table for, Very like, specific. is there a way that we normally do it? Because it, we're, like, asking someone to represent us. Well, if, we haven't, we haven't, I would have to say, normally... We, we haven't normally done this. We haven't, this is an opportunity that has come up mm -hmm. and because I received and I'm sure some of the rest of you um, received this and it pertains to British Columbia and they were looking for, I've, I've just brought it to the table for information for us to make a decision on because I'm, I'm pretty sure if we were to go back and, and look at the historical record, um, Mayor Dooley went as a member as a representative of the Regional District of Central Kootenai. Okay, I just... And previous to that, I don't think we ever have had a member from this table on FCM. And I only say that because back when I was elected back there in the dark ages of the late 90s, <laughs> is that um, in my mind, FCM, FCM has been around for a while, but FCM, there, there wasn't the importance of... Uh, FCM. There wasn't, I just have to say it, that's the way it felt. Like there wasn't the importance of FCM to participate, but with things like the Green Municipal Fund and, and as the advocacy has worked and more money has flown federally to provincial entities and then the provin, the, because all this money doesn't, the FCM money doesn't come to Nelson, it goes to the province and then like, but it's federal money. Um, and, and the gas tax it's become uh, more interesting to see the evolution of the FCM as an organization, as there's more involvement and more money that streams from the federal government to provincial um, bodies and then to local governments. So I just think that there, 
their role has over time morphed into something bigger yeah. with more voice and, and impact in terms of that relationship with the federal government. Okay, so I just looked on their website when we found out about this late item and there looks like there's 15 focus areas of the FCM and one of them as Councillor Lochtenberg alluded to has I believe it's well we've got public transit in here and um, climate and sustainability um, but as a table we haven't had an opportunity to do our own strategic planning yet and mm -hmm. so I'm wondering how what we come together to bring would align with these 15 what are they called? Focus areas. And so I'm just wondering about that chicken and the egg there in terms of a new set. Right, yeah. Councillor Woodward. Um, I would just say um, that I think it's really vital that small communities like ours are represented on these big boards. Because you know you typically would have a lot of sway with sort of Vancouver, Toronto, the large urban centers, but you know the vast swaths of Canada lives in, in rural or small towns. So I think I think it's really um, critical, actually, that 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 voices like ours are on a board like this, and the concerns of small communities like this are are heard at the at the highest levels. Um, and I think you know. On that list, Councillor Tate, you know, many things that are on that list are, we're going to be struggling with as well. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, when you go to UBCM, you see how important it is that we're there to get the ear of ministers, to connect with other municipalities, other councillors, other mayors. Um, and then at the AKBLG, which is the local UBCM here in this region, again, it's like, you know, that connection piece. So uh, that we're not just kind of reinventing the wheel on our own, trying to do solve problems. We're actually like communicating with each other. Um, so I would say those three levels, AKBLG, UBCM, and FCM are all critical to have a, um, a, a network of communication uh, between uh, especially small municipalities. So... Sense. Councillor Pinero. Yeah, um, with respect to you, Rick, and, and what you brought forward, I think um, that all sounds really important and, and, uh, and good. And I'm kind of wondering what sort of, like, they, we obviously have a voice. What's the difference between having a voice? from afar or we are members right and and what what is the difference between that and, and having somebody actually physically go there and sit there i mean and i just ask because i think there's going to be people and 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 i find myself you know it crosses my mind also there's it's a bit of a we're in a bit of an economic problem I think for a lot of people in town and and there's lots of problems here that that need money and and need focus and need attention and 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 um and I and I understand that we're doing that as well and I just I just think that if we were to send somebody and and that would be an expense that we take on I would like to see us do that with with a real understanding of what is to be I know you said it's sort of not what we can do, but you know, for Nelson, it's what we can do for the, for the, for the greater good, in, in, in that sense, and bringing our perspective and all that. But I think we do have to factor in that other thing as well, given the, the climate that we're in right now, and, and given the people are generally hurting for cash. And so, if it's a, if it's a perception that we're spending money on something that we don't really need to spend money on, I think that we will have to field those questions and, and, and we'll have to have a good idea of why we're sending that person, with what sort of mandate, with what sort of hopes to as an outcome for our community. And then the other thing, the, the greater good, I think is important. It's also less immediate. And I think that people um, 
will need to digest that. So I, I think we need to, as a, as a council, if that's the direction we go, I think we really need to articulate what we are hoping for there and what the upside of that is, what we're hoping to gain, because I think we will, people will want to know that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm new to this and I don't understand all the intricacies. I just feel like Nelson does have a voice in some way and and just how you know change and good things can come from the federal level and they can come down to us i think we also have power within our within our region within our municipality to innovate and to be an example to people that they pick up on without you know and that's just us doing our thing here i think nelson next from what you guys did in the last term i think it's a great example of that um there's people that are asking us about that there's people that are taking their direction from that and that didn't come from the federal government that came from from us from what i understand right so i i don't see it as one or the other i, don't, I, I think that's not realistic i think there's obviously things to be had on both ends but I, I really do urge us to have a good thought about balancing that out and what what we can gain by having somebody there and and what we can do without having somebody there and, and, and just be able to articulate that to people when, when it comes up, because I, I, I know that it will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you want to spawn, but I'm just going to keep going around with the questions. Yeah, no problem. Councillor um, Page and then Councillor Payne. Yeah, I don't necessarily think um, it doesn't, I, I think there's value to having someone nominated and put to the board. What's resonating with me strongly at this table is the clarification of a mandate and the formation of a mandate. And given that we have only one meeting before our strategic planning for this particular overlap, and then you have the virtual and then you're into the AGM, I would be most comfortable making a motion to refer the idea of having an FCM nomination to our strategic planning session and have a discussion about a mandate and figure out our strategic plans and then decide when we go into that AGM that we will put forward a nominee and what that nominee, what the marching orders for that nominee will be. And that this junction, just leave it as is, because uh, we just simply haven't had that opportunity to be like, what is the set direction of this term? Is it housing? Is it climate and environment? Is it economic inequality? Like, what are the things that are going to be uh, on the work plan for the next four years? And I think once we have that clarity and go through those those really deep discussions, then we can say, you know, and a mandate to a representative to FCM, we will nominate, uh, can then carry that voice forward and, and take that, our experience out there. So I would make a motion to refer it to strategic planning, understanding, of course, that this window would close, but it would be opened again at the end of May. Okay, now I'm going to use the wrong set of orders, so I'm going to look over at the corporate <laughs> officer because under Bruno's, the motion to refer is not debatable. <laughs> and so I would need a seconder for a referral. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the motion to refer, is, to refer has been made, and I would need a seconder. And so just so you understand how this works, so somebody seconds his motion, the motion to refer can be debatable defeated it can be debated too and it can be debated yeah so oh okay it so be okay, be. Roberts rules, okay, okay. Is. that's where i get this is where i get confused because i've for 20 years used a different rule book um but a seconder we could have debate um if it if it fails then we go back to where we were but the we have a motion to refer at this point do i have a seconder on the motion to refer And the referral with the, the direction for referral is to discuss it at strategic planning, mm -hmm. just so because it referral should come with some direction. Yeah. Can I have a clarification? Yes. Would that mean we would miss this entrance window? Mm -hmm. Well, this entrance window right now is for, to be clear, if I'm reading this correctly, is to finish off the term because what's happened is that some people didn't get reelected. Mm -hmm. And now there's openings, and they want to fill the board until the AGM. We are sending, we've made the agreement already that we are sending Councillor Lockenberg to 
this first FCM meeting in Toronto in May, in which case where the, this whole process starts over again. I mean, so unlike um, uh, Director Maine from the RDCK, where the RDCK has voted to keep her, like, so obviously these other openings have come because people haven't gotten elected and nobody was, well, they're probably not elected at all, mm -hmm. right? Whereas Councillor Maine has been elected in Silverton, but it was not elected to the regional district board. But the board has gone ahead to continue to um, uh, fund her um, activities. So does that help you? Basically, this would be for two meetings. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it would be reopened. Re yes. Anyway. So don't we need to second to discuss? Or? Yeah, so I, he asked the question for clarification, so okay. I'm still waiting for, I'm going to count to like three, and if there's no seconder for referral, we will continue to debate because referral will die on the table. I'll second it. Okay. Yeah, I'll second it. Okay, so referral has been moved and seconded. Debate around referring this to strategic planning. Uh, I'll let the uh, seconder... Um, speak and then Councillor Payne. Um, thank you, Mayor. Through the chair, I think um, the motion to refer to the strategic planning session makes sense. Um, the I am concerned about the window. The the advantage to getting just somebody in there is that you do have a big leg up for when you come to the the AGM and you you and you begin the process again. Whoever's in that role is very is the incumbent is likely to hold it if you see what i mean so there's and then it becomes a bit of a fight to unseat the incumbent and to be honest I, i'm not that interested in getting into that sort of campaign personally if i was in the role so there's that's the my hesitation to councillor page's motion it's like mm. it's, it's kind of an opportunity to do it having said that i think he's generally right it would be really good to have that strategic plan ahead of time so we can sort of figure out where we want to go as a municipality before we take these bigger steps into mm -hmm. the difference though and i and i'm of two minds of this so i'll just i'll share the back and forth i'm debating this with myself actually <laughs> um we don't need to be here yeah you don't need to be here. <laughs> i need to be here um no i would just say this it which is whatever the mandate is that can be said at the strategic session so we've got the the seat is ours and then the mandate comes after so that's one reason to sort of move ahead and just do this now and then set the mandate later i think whatever the role is at fcm like whatever the mandate is there is an advantage to fcm and councillor pinero through the chair to your point it's that the advocacy the, the federal government is in many ways in our economy as we all know really the source of of money <laughs> it's sure the provinces and the feds both have taxational but really the federal government if they decide we've got a, a crisis in this decade for whatever reason climate being the most obvious we are going to generate or pump in billions of dollars into the economy they can do that whereas the provinces don't have that same capacity to inject a lot of liquidity into into the economy if the federal government does do that, there that FC, FCM and that board in particular would be the advocates for that money going to municipalities, and 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 how, you know, with the support of staff, FCM has quite a staff. The FCM board negotiating amongst themselves, saying, okay, this is the vision for what municipalities would do with billions of dollars. So the the whole retrofit industry, should it be led by municipalities as opposed to being led by sectors? Um, transit, is, which is a priority of the federal government, that was FCM that in its negotiations and lobbying with the federal government that made it a priority for the federal government. So billions of dollars into transit, it's the board that would do that. And the, in my opinion, the primary difference between say the, the board versus just general FCM membership is night and day. Like the, the board has direct meetings with ministers and senior bureaucrats. They're the ones who essentially do the work of advocating on behalf of municipalities. The, the general membership essentially elects the board 
and, and, and that's it. So your advocacy is, as a municipality, if we're not on the board, is kind of nil. There's not much advocacy at all. So that, that would be the difference between the board seat and, and not. And, and I just really want to stress that I believe, and I think the federal government has said this, that we're talking about billions of dollars, new money is at stake, and where does that get spent and how? That's the conversation I think that this next couple of years will, and particularly this year and, and next year will, will set. So I, to, to, the, to the motion, I don't know. I'm, I'm of two minds. I'd go either way. Should we set the strategic plan or not? Uh, right now I think I'm leaning towards get the seat and then go to the strategic plan and really figure out what the mandate should be. Councillor Payne. Uh, I definitely see the value in advocacy of municipalities, especially small rural municipalities, especially from um, a distance very far removed from where many of the big decisions are made so that you have on the ground advocacy. Um, and I also am very sensitive to spending money where it's we have the most leverage from that. What we're looking at right now is, in my opinion, I'm just doing quick estimates in my head, of what it would cost for us to have a member until the end of May. And it's fairly insignificant to get um, a member there and back for one conference and then to have them, um, you said a virtual conference. Yeah, it's virtual. I the other thing I think is important to know is we um, can put a candidate forward if we so choose, but that will not be the candidate necessarily. There will be other candidates. It's interesting if you look at the members of um, that are currently on the FCM board there I don't I don't see anyone from a small municipality I see a regional Susan district Hewitt. pardon mayor, me mayor of Caswell yeah sorry sorry so a small yeah sure. um, outside of our district I should have said oh, sure. so when you look around uh, the province there were a couple of other regional districts mm -hmm. uh, so there's I think there's pretty significant value in anyone who's lived in a metropolitan area and then lived in a rural area recognizes those pretty quickly. So I think, um, I don't want to relate this to gambling, but the fee to ante up on this to get your leg in the door is pretty small to get a seat at the table, which would give us a better position to assess the, the value and more information on what the ongoing costs would be. So I think it's a opportune. I think it's an opportunity for us to look at what this could both bring to Nelson, rural municipalities, British Columbia, there's multifaceted benefits that could accrue, but also how we can contribute um, as a you know, pretty progressive community t to assist other communities around the country. So I, I really appreciate the aligning it with our strategic vision, but I, I don't want to miss the window. Any further discussion on referral? Remember, we're talking about referral at this junction. And the direction was referral to the strategic um, planning meeting. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of referral to strategic planning meeting. There's two in favor. All those opposed to not referring? Referring. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, did you get that? Opposed to not? Yeah. Well, I mean, then, then, opposed. Then. Yeah. So, I mean, we're in favor of. Are in favor <laughs> of not referring. Of not referring. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, referral um, fails. So, now we are back to the discussion of sending somebody and so then the next question would be is we're back to are we going to send somebody and then who are we going to send and we still need to have then a recommendation for us to pass 
Councillor Woodward. Uh, I would like to move we send Councillor Lautenberg. Okay. And, or wait, I should say, I, put his well, name forward my, for the nomination. Yes, if he accepts. probably be clear about <laughs> if, if he accepts. Yes? Yes. Sarah's go. So, as a second step, yeah. do you also want to include in that resolution that you, the city I think we will, have to. Yeah, I think we have I'll, to yeah, read this. I need that somewhere. It can be a separate resolution, the financial piece, mm -hmm. or it can be included. Uh, just including it. Okay, okay. that's good. Yep. So That's how I have it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, 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 I just I preface that I feel like Councillor Lautenberg has a, a deep well of knowledge working at this level already uh, from his previous work. So, and he has a lot of networks. So he's going in on a strong foot. So uh, that's that's I have a lot of confidence that he could actually really use that position to. Uh, uh, celebrate and bring forward what we've done as a small community and we've always talked about the work we're doing here uh, is really uh, about modeling what a small community can do uh, and so I think uh, him bringing that forward to that level uh, that table would be pretty pretty important so, so do I need a seconder on that yes you do need a seconder seconded by Councillor Page Payne <laughs> Too many peas. <laughs> Too many peas, you guys. The um, so any um further discussion or I just I just want to comment that this is a large um table mm -hmm. at FCM, mm -hmm. and um I know that Councillor Lockenberg, near and dear to his heart, is uh, uh the environment and um, the things around climate change, and there is no um guarantee at the table that he's going to get the climate change um, portfolio or however they they branch those things out. So um, just to be aware that you don't, like obviously at these meetings, I, I would imagine at this point you're going to get filled in somewhere and then, you know, if he was to continue on or felt that there was value when he reports back to tell us in terms of going forward um, come June when there's the next AGM, is that um, you do? It isn't. It isn't necessarily you get to go where you For want sure. to go. Just so you want, just so everybody at the table understands that. Sure. That you know, I think here in Nelson we have a very climate focus. We're very focused on Nelson Next and making sure that all of our departments and everything that we do is looked at with the climate lens and with the social justice lens. But you might you might not end up necessarily right where you want to be on at, at, at that table because it is a it is a big table for sure so it's uh councillor page okay um i would be opposed at this moment and it's for one very specific reason and this is what i'd hope we will talk about at strategic planning um one of the things i think in a governance space that we can do better is is formation of how we handle resolutions both to UBCM, AKBLG, and FCM. That's not really, we don't, we, we have not historically uh, taken significant time at understanding and reviewing the resolution processes and the governance processes of these bodies as we put forward changes we'd like to do or like to see happen on those different levels of government. And so I, I think that's kind of work we want to wrestle with on a governance side of things, on how we want to structure this particular council board uh, and see if there's more buy-in to sit down and uh, Councillor Pinero definitely touched on it, those, those ways that we interact with these organizations to move policy uh, forward inside of this table and broadcast that message out. And I think that's just structural work that we have to learn how to do. Or, or rediscover how to do or, or, or model best practices on how to do so that we're really taking the, the issues that are in those advocacy realms outside of our local control and, and being able to bring them into a format that we can get buy-in from the membership of the FCM so those pass and move through the board or UBCM or wherever we want to press those advocacy pieces because I have no doubt on the climate file uh, the expert in the room is definitely Councillor Lautenberg. But when we look at the holistic 15 focus areas, 
it's like, is that where our focus will want to be in the end? And I think that will come out in, through strategic planning. So that's my biased opinion. <laughs> Further discussion. Okay, so to be clear, we now have a motion that's been moved and seconded in front of us. And that is, is that part one is that we would like to send um, Councillor Lockenberg's name forward as a nominee for the one position at large that's available currently. And part two of that is that we are, as the City of Nelson, um, willing to incur the expenses to allow um, a councillor to participate in this process, basically. Everybody's clear on what the motion is? So two parts, Council Lockenberg, and then we're gonna, in general, pick up the tab. Okay, so seeing no further discussion, I'm getting a nod, are we all still in order and following all of the rules? <laughs> okay, so yeah, there's nothing like having, you know, a late item, just, you know, might as well try it on the first council meeting. Um, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Okay, we have, uh, that carries. So... Congratulations, Councillor Lockenberg. Uh, we'll get the, you're gonna have to have some paperwork signed. Um, I think maybe stop in at some time in the balance of the week to sign the paperwork. It has to be in by uh, January the 30th. Okay, perfect timing. And here, you know, we were kind of afraid that we wouldn't have enough front end stuff to get us to the dinner break. <laughs> so if I could have a motion to uh, recess Moved by Councillor Woodward, seconded by Councillor Lockenberg. All those in favor? And we will be back at 7, 8, 7 p.m. to continue. <laughs> ah, well, and they're awfully polite. They are. Hi, guys. Very, I feel I should be out. Even, even the press is looking very polite. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened to your sign? I put, the, I, I put the media sign back on that table. I found it the other day, and somebody oh, moved it. Media. <laughs> <laughs> you yes. yes. Oh, I found serious. it. I found it hidden when I was going through some drawers, and I put it on the table. And there you go. There's your real right there. <laughs> yes. I know, right? <laughs> so, so is this? Um, Councillor Tate brought this to our attention the other day. Is this the best angle for the camera to pick up what the names um, are? Probably. You need to turn them all a a away. I would say by the looks of the camera, that angle. like that. Is there. An end? there you go. Yeah, like okay. that. <laughs> I, I never even thought of it until you did it the other but day. But then what happens is that I can't remember anybody's name. But okay. no. <laughs> Just the say early hey Alzheimer's, you. Alzheimer's, yeah, I hate oh, you. I'm supposed to know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, they point that way, I would imagine, for the pickup of the camera. Because now, so yeah. now I can see everybody's in the in the. For those of us who Rick wish to be identified. <laughs> Jesse's. Just okay, well, it's 7 o'clock. on my bald spot. <laughs> and... Um, just to remind those that have joined us now is that we are using the new procedural bylaw and that council meetings uh, do officially start, the full business meetings uh, do start at 4.30. Um, and so at this point, I'd like a motion to reconvene, please. So moved. Moved by Councillor Page, seconded by Councillor Woodward. All those in favor? And that carries. Uh, on to item number nine of the agenda, recommendations from Committee of the Whole meetings. We have none. Uh, there's no requests, no delegations this evening. So moving um, on to item 12, and this is the first uh, three readings of the fees and chargement amendment for uh, waste and wastewater rates. 
Is there a mover? There's a document here. Hopefully you all got an opportunity to review it. We had a, a presentation on November the 14th and the 5th regarding water and waste, uh, wastewater. And so I see a mover. Move, so moved. And is there a seconder? Uh, seconded by Councillor Woodward. Councillor Page, if you would like to read out what the rec recommendation is, please. And we'll pass them of course. individually. So item number one. <clears throat> yeah, so annually, annually the city reviews the long-term operation operating and capital plan for water and wastewater utilities. The review is to ensure that the rates are set at a level that ensures sufficient funds to cover annual expenditures, as well as providing adequate reserves to fund future capital expenditures. Council is now requested to pass first three readings of the fees and charges amendment, 2023 water and wastewater rates, bylaw number 3562,2023. And so the recommendation is, um, the first recommendation is, is that it be introduced and read for the first time and read by second time by title only. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor, and that carries. Uh, recommendation number two, does somebody want to move that one, please? Councillor Woodward, and is there a seconder? Councillor Tate, and Councillor Woodward, if you don't mind, reading the second recommendation. That the Corporation of the City of Nelson Fees and Charges Amendment 2023 water and wastewater rates bylaw number 3562 2023 be read a <coughs> third time by title only. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I was, I was just going to say, Mayor, um, for the public that might think that we're just passing this <laughs> without discussion, we did have quite an extensive. Yeah, those two dates, the 14th and yeah. the 5th. And yeah. Yeah. So we've had, and those were. Um, I believe that those meetings were uh, streamed. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So both of those. That presentation follows. That presentation, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. We talked. So um, and the reason that we're doing these ones now is uh, just so everybody knows is that we have to get these out in the mail because these are payable. Um, director Jury, these are March the first. We pay the water. Yep, fifteenth to get your uh, discount. They get the discounts, yes. so these have to. That's why we're moving these now, so that we can make the deadline to get them out into the mail. So that's been moved and seconded. All in favor, and that carries. Thank you very much. Moving on to item B. Oh, recommendations from staff. And uh, item 12A, the climate adaption. Steep Creek Hazard Assessment and Grant Application. So, summary is, is the development services with support of the B BGC Engineering um, will present to Council and the community the Steep Creek Hazard Assessment completed for the City. The Steep Creek Hazard Assessment is a crucial initial step in the City's effort to reduce risks associated with steep creeks. Council is requested to accept the Steep Creek Hazard Assessment. This is supposed to be like a tongue twister. Yeah. has information and to pass the required resolution to complete the grant applications to apply for detailed hazard mapping and policy development. And now our consultants have joined us on video conference. So we will hear from them. So Chris Holmes and Lauren Hutchinson look to be here to uh, do the presentation. And oh, there you are, Natalie. <laughs> And Natalie's going to run the show from the other end there. Yes, I will. I'll, I'll just do a quick intro, if that's okay with mm -hmm. Council and Mayor. That's fine. I, I turned it on. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So that's great. I think we did a little intro there for me. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, this report is an initiative to gain an understanding of the risks associated with steep creeks in our community. Preparing for the future is one of our top priorities in the Climate Action Plan Nelson Next, and a key aspect of this work is identifying and mitigating hazards to build resilience to climate change. The Steep Creek work was completed with the Adaptation and Climate Tactics um, Network project team, meaning we worked collaboratively on this project as these hazards impact a number of city departments, including the Climate and Energy team, 
emergency management, public works, and development services. Representatives from those departments are here, if Council has any questions for them. <laughs> uh, Steep Creek hazards, such as floods, debris flows, and debris floods, um, pose a risk to mountain communities. Steep creeks can impact pedestrians, vehicle traffic, residents, development, and infrastructure, particularly during periods of heavy rainfall or snowmelt. To address these issues comprehensively, BGC Engineering was contacted to complete a Steep Creek Hazard Assessment for the City to evaluate four major creeks. The Steep Creek Hazard Assessment is a crucial initial step in the City's efforts to reduce risks associated with Steep Creeks by taking a proactive approach to protecting residents, development and infrastructure and enhancing community resilience. Um, I'll hand it over to BGC in a minute here to present the findings from the report. And once BGC is completed, I'll finish the presentation with next steps. So please go ahead, Lauren and Chris. Thanks so much, Natalie, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to present today. Um, to just do a quick AV check, are you hearing us okay? Okay, fantastic, that's really helpful. I'll introduce myself and then pass it to Chris to introduce himself as well. Um, really thankful for the opportunity to be here and present this today. I am Lauren Hutchinson. I'm a geotechnical engineer based in our Vancouver office, though I live in Squamish, which is another mountainous and beautiful area that uh, is subject to a whole range of, of hazard types. And I've had the pleasure to work and support communities such as Nelson, including the District of North Vancouver, Couch and Valley Regional District, um, Squamish Lula Regional District, and the town of Canmore in some similar <clears throat> assessments to understand the hazards that they face and evaluate what mitigation options or risk reduction options are available to them. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Mayor and Councils, it's uh, appreciate the chance to share some of the results from our, our study here. Just a, a quick introduction on myself, uh, principal to scientist with BGC Engineering, uh, working in the field of natural hazards and risk management for the last 25 years, uh, and with the regional district of Central Kootenai in this area uh, for the last about the last five years on similar work across the district, and this is part of province-wide initiatives that BGC is involved with to better understand and make sense of and make better decisions around the use of land in areas that are subject to steep creek hazards, debris floods, debris flows, and then into the flood type processes as well. Uh, pass it back to Lauren. Uh, we have a presentation prepared uh, to help structure our conversation around the current work and, and then talk about next steps. Uh, Lauren? Thanks, Chris. I'm just working on sharing my screen and I'm seeing it on the screen behind you there, Mayor. Great. Excellent. So I'll begin to just walk through some of the objectives of the study that we had and then we'll get into the findings and what uh, recommendations we have moving forward. So we completed a desktop and field review of Steep Creek Hazards. We looked at four creeks. So Anderson Creek, Ward Creek, Cottonwood and Smelter Creek. And then as we'll get into, Cottonwood Creek has its watershed extending beyond the municipal boundary with a number of key tributaries that influence the processes and the potential hazards and risks within the municipal boundary. So we looked at those creeks as well. Our goal in doing so was to update the hazard boundaries and also to prioritize the needs for additional assessment of steep creek hazards in support of planning and decision making for Nelson. I will note that Five Mile Creek, which is off of the map that you see here a bit to the northeast, um, was not considered at this stage in this assessment because it is outside of the municipal boundary, but we understand that it's an important water source for the city and may need to be considered at future stages. To understand the hazards that we looked at, we considered steep creek hazards, which encompass a range from floods, debris floods and debris flows that all can occur on creeks that have slopes steeper than about three degrees or 5%. And with that in mind, that might be a little bit different than what some have in mind for, for steep. Um, as you can see, 
we've got a schematic here on the left hand side we've got what would typically be a flood and then as you move to have more debris suspended within the water you get faster flows originating from smaller watersheds and typically steeper channels. You can have what's called a debris flood, which is where you typically have about 20% debris concentration, and then all the way up to a debris flow, which is closer to about 50% debris concentration. And that can be much closer to like the, con the consistency of wet concrete. And so given that continuum of processes, we need to evaluate what the dominant process type on an individual channel may be. And recognizing that at different times or in response to different amounts of flow, creeks can experience one or more of these types of hazards. And recognizing which hazards are likely to occur is a really important part of evaluating what risk management approaches may be applicable and need to be considered for that proactive decision making. That's one piece, that's the hazard piece. I'll, I'll pass to Chris to describe some of the other components that need to be considered for the risk. Sure, um, when, when one needs to make a decision that's based around risk, uh, it's helpful to unpack what that means. And, and as a starting point, Lauren has spoken to the types of hazard that uh, may affect Nelson and neighboring communities. Uh, that could also include, although it wasn't part of this study, the flood hazard along the west arm of Kootenai Lake. Uh, the second half of risk is, is the exposure of the different types of assets or things of value that Nelson may care about and that may lie in the floodplain or on these alluvial fans. Risk is at the intersection of those where we're interested in how vulnerable the, uh, those assets in the community and the population may be for hazard. It's important to consider both when uh, Nelson is uh, building a more resilient community to climate change because it provides a structure to uh, understand the different parts of risk that can be adjusted to become more resilient, whether that's to manage the hazard or perhaps the exposure or the vulnerability as well. And so this work is foundational to some of those subsequent steps to build in a longer term plan to, to uh, put these pieces in place at greater levels of detail within the city boundary. If you go to the next slide uh, there, before passing it back to Lauren, I'm good, just gonna back us up a little bit. Uh, after the Johnson Landing landslide that I'm sure all folks in this room are well aware of about a decade ago now, um, at district-wide scale, one of the key recommendations coming out of the coroner's report from that, that uh, tragic event was to get a better handle on this sort of hazard district-wide. Uh, that was work led by the Regional District of Central Kootenai, and BGC uh, was retained by the district in 2018 to advance that work. We inventoried about uh, just over 400 alluvial fans, as well as many floodplains across the district, of which 16 were advanced to a detailed level of hazard assessment in 2019 and 2020. Putting in motion the district-wide risk prioritization set the district up quite well to obtain funding, to obtain uh, the, the means to do the necessary uh, follow-up work. Uh, that work has led to today uh, mitigation options assessment and preliminary design at a select number of creeks, including to Hommel Creek, Eagle Creek, and, and the village of Salmo. And you, you, as you can see on the screen here, you can see outlines from some of that inventory work that formed the starting point for the subsequent steps of work that we were involved with here in Nelson at greater levels of detail. So with the, that just helps set that up. I'll, I'll pass back to Lauren now to, to provide a summary of the results that we've found at these different hazard areas. Thanks, Chris. So I'll just move very briefly through each of the creeks to provide a little bit of an overview, starting with Anderson Creek. So Anderson Creek, you can see the orange area here is what we would call the alluvial fan. So when the water on the creek comes out of the watershed where it's typically confined, then over history, it will tend to want to deposit in what's uh, characteristic and 
um, able to be viewed in detailed topography as a fan. Um, something that you'll notice on the Anderson Creek fan is there's a, an area that we've got highlighted in yellow here, which is what we call a paleo fan, indicating that it was formed as during geologic history and it's unlikely to be impacted by modern events unless there is a major change. So the active fan area is the area that's not shaded. And Anderson Creek is prone to debris floods. One of the main concerns with debris flooding is the potential for erosion on the banks and also the potential for um, impacts and sedimentation associated with the sediment that's carried by a debris flood. And given the level of development on the Anderson Creek fan, <clears throat> we've prioritized it as high economic risk, high potential economic risk, and we recommend detailed hazard and risk assessment to better understand and manage the potential risks. If we move next to Cottonwood Creek, this is where we talked about those main tributaries. <clears throat> so we looked at Gold Creek, Salis Creek, and Give Out Creek, each of which are outside of the Nelson Municipal Boundary. But the behavior or the potential processes on these creek will have an impact down into the municipal boundary. Uh, these creeks are subject to different process types. Gold and Salis Creek, we expect, could experience debris floods and on Give Out Creek, we expect it could experience debris flows with the potential to add a, a pulse of sediment into Cottonwood Creek that then gets carried downstream. And again, given the level of development on the Cottonwood Creek fan, we've categorized it as high economic risk and do recommend that a detailed hazard and risk assessment be completed in the future and that that assessment include these tributary creeks for a comprehensive study. As in our report, I'll call our attention quickly to one of those tributary creeks, which is Give Out Creek. And this is the creek that we <clears throat> have identified as potentially being susceptible to debris flows, which you might recall are the process type that have that higher sediment concentration and thus have higher potential impact forces to areas that are developed. On Give Out Creek, the development is largely mobile and manufactured homes, which are relatively less uh, resilient to impact than, for example, a wood frame or a concrete frame structure. And so we've identified that there is potential high life safety risk on Give Out Creek. And um, we understand that the RDCK has <clears throat> communicated that or will be communicating that to the residents. The other thing to note with Give Out Creek uh, that may be pertinent to Nelson is that there is a almost a 90 degree intersection between Give Out Creek and then Cottonwood Creek, right where Highway 6 is, and that there's very little storage area there. So there's the potential for impacts to residents. There's also potential for impacts to Highway 6 that may need to be considered for the, the implications that may have. And our recommendation there again is to have a detailed hazard and risk assessment, but to do so in concert with that full Cottonwood Creek system. If we move to Ward Creek, which is the creek, this is located, this is the um, Nelson Rail Trail. This creek is a little bit different. We expect that it's subject to clear water floods and debris floods. So again, the concern there is potential erosion and nuisance flooding. Um, we have assessed this to be lower risk than Anderson or Cottonwood, so a moderate economic risk. It would be unlikely that some of the events that could occur on Ward Creek would be of sufficient intensity to result in life safety risk to those on the fan. Um, and one difference with some of the other creeks is that this fan is perhaps smaller than the potential area that could become inundated. And the reason for that is the creek comes down and then it enters a stormwater system. And if there was a blockage at that location, you may see flooding that extends beyond this, this fan area um, where flows potentially conveyed down roadways. And so we recommend that uh, a climate change and debris hazard assessment be done to ensure that the culverts are sufficiently sized to be able to convey the flows that we that might be expected on Ward Creek and to evaluate uh, any potential 
damages that could occur to the Nelson Rail Trail. And finally, Smelter Creek. This is located farther to the west. Uh, the fan area intersects the golf course. This creek, um, we have evaluated that it, because it's got a very small and very steep watershed that it could be susceptible to debris flows. The fan itself has relatively little development on it at the moment, um, but it also has high potential for avulsion. And so what that means is that the creek is not very well incised or it's not very confined to the existing channel and it has the potential to migrate from its current location. And so our recommendation there is that in advance of any residential development on the fan, um, that a hazard and risk assessment be completed to evaluate if any risk management strategies need to be implemented as part of those developments. I'll pass it back to Chris to, to summarize our full recommendations across the creeks. Sure, yeah, thanks, thanks, Lauren. We'll get into a couple of uh, details, or at least as a, as a summary level as to what this might entail. Uh, but the priority at level order that, that we're uh, putting forward for the city really recognizes that this, in most cases, in many communities, is a bit of a longer term process that may need to be phased over time and potentially over multiple funding intakes or grants or other ways that a city typically might need to fund for their work on these creeks. And uh, this process, frankly, in some cases can take several years. Uh, in this case, uh, we are suggesting that Anderson Creek be a uh, first consideration given the population density on that fan, the confinement, and the types of vulnerabilities that some of those residents have. Uh, Cottonwood Creek, uh, which we suggest uh, be a study that's conducted in collaboration with the district, given the source of the uh, creek and district lands. Uh, Smelter Creek, a little different, uh, and the proponent for development there may have involvement uh, depending on land use planning, uh, but uh, to put forward additional assessment in advance of residential development. And then, it, as Lauren mentioned on Ward Creek, a debris hazard assessment. And we can, we can provide a few examples of what that might also look like uh, based on other experience in different communities. District of North Vancouver is a great example of, of, of a community that contains many types of creeks very similar to Ward Creek that we've worked on. Um, go to the next slide there, Lauren. And we'll just provide a couple of examples. These examples are similar to the work that has been recently completed in neighboring creeks in the regional district of Central Kootenai. And so Nelson does have some quick analogs to see what this type of work might look like. Uh, the types of work that would be included here aim to provide a basis for decision making on a fan such as Anderson Creek in this case, where hazard zone maps or what might be referred to as composite hazard maps are, are used to do a couple of different things. Um, the first is to provide a good basis to inform applications for development permitting, to try to inform what that should look like. For example, it might look a little different for a party that was putting forward an application in an area that was quite low hazard compared to an area that was much higher hazard. It also provides some of the ingredients that are needed by a local geotechnical consultant, for example, to do the necessary work to provide uh, an assessment for a safe for the use intended type report. The second is at fan scale. This has to do with the estimation of life safety risk and economic risk. If mitigation is required, the typical standard today is that any grant funding must defend the value proposition for that mitigation work. In other words, that the benefits of the mitigation outweigh its costs. It's also a time when the city would likely want to consider the operational and maintenance needs and what might it look like, for example, to take ownership of structures. And this would be the time that 
uh, an assessment could provide information to, to support decision making around that. And then lastly, uh, conceptual risk management options, which would be uh, to provide an idea of what risk management might look like on a fan like this at a level of detail that can help the community understand what, what it would take. And also that would form the basis for funding applications to do the work, to, to design it and build it. And again, this is the sort of work that's been advanced elsewhere. Duhamel Creek is one good example on the RDCK right now. And so you can see analogs of where this is about a year or two in the future from where Nelson is sitting right now. Um, that might be useful to consider. Um, next, next slide. Uh, so that was one example. And in the interest of time, uh, maybe I'll stop there, but I'll just speak briefly to one planning intake that's coming up. Um, folks in this room may be aware of the Union of BC Municipalities Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. It's been around for a number of years. This year, it's been adjusted uh, quite substantially to cover a broader range of hazards than have been eligible in the past and to separate the funding into three categories. Foundational activities, uh, which is capped at $150,000 of funding, and it's to do the type of risk assessment work that, that I just described. The second is non-structural activities. This generally relates to supporting the decision processes themselves, land, land use planning, community education, uh, policy development. In other words, to take number one and build the processes around that to make decisions. And then the third are cases where small scale structural activities under $2 million might be fundable. Um, generally speaking, in order to, to apply for that, uh, numbers one and two, or at least number one, needs to be completed as a prerequisite. There are a few other rules around these uh, that we can get into if folks have questions, um, but the uh, uh, one key piece is that they can't depend on each other in, in a single application. So for this work, it would be a foundational type uh, project that would be needed to start the process at, uh, uh, on Anderson Creek as, as one example. The next funding intake coming up is for February 20, 24th of 2023, so coming up relatively soon. Uh, Lauren, is there anything else that I'm missing on, on that? Or did you have any other comments before we go on on the application? Um, perhaps if you could just describe the Cambio communities um, as where this information is housed. Sure. Uh, today, increasingly, uh, the most flexible way to provide maps is in a digital space. Um, folks here, um, Mayor and Council, you may uh, have been exposed to the many, many, many reports that can get generated uh, and produced on PDF maps and reports that can be uh, frankly quite difficult to manage over time as they accumulate. For that reason, uh, all of the work to date has been published on a web application called Cambio where the user can browse to the sites and see information about the hazard and the elements at risk that are in those areas. It provides a way to communicate hazard information that's easy to access and update over time. And in fact, this work for Nelson has updated the district-wide work for RDCK that was completed a year ago. The geospatial data, the data underlying this, is also provided over to the city for use by GIS staff as the GIS staff might see fit. Uh, but it, it has proven to be quite a helpful tool, both here in this district and also in many other locations around British Columbia, where there is a need to have a wide diversity of users uh, provided with easy access to this type of information. And so uh, we can provide uh, the user access information after this meeting, if desired, and, and all of you are certainly free and welcome to explore it. Um, as, as you have time. Lauren? Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. I think we can leave it there and pass it back to Natalie. And I know there'll be some time for questions if that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Lauren and Chris, for your presentation. Um, so yeah, as Lauren and Chris mentioned in their presentation there, um, 
Uh, there is the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Um, staff's recommending that Anderson Fell Creek is applied for in the current grant stream for detailed hazard mapping in line with the rep recommendation from the report under Category 1. In addition, staff are also looking to apply for Category 2 non-structural projects to develop policy to support community and assist staff with applications. So that can include planning and development policy framework, um, risk tolerance policy, education strategies, and public engagement. We're working on the exact details of how that's all gonna work out, but I do think it would be beneficial and help us process applications a bit more streamlined. So in terms of next steps, um, one is apply for grant funding. If council supports a request, we will move forward in, in crafting those grant applications and submitting those for both categories. The uh, second is develop a creek inspection policy. So staff currently complete creek inspections um, during freshet or periods of heavy rain. Staff will support this work by developing a core council policy on how and when the creeks are inspected. Public communication um, is a third. So the Street Creek Hazard Assessment Report and project updates will be posted on the city website. In addition, staff will develop communication material for residents to identify and understand the steep creek hazards. And then lastly, uh, staff will host a workshop with um, local geotechnical engineers to present the steep creek um, assessment report so that it can be used in their work. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And I know the arms are going to go up, so we'll start with uh, Councillor Woodward followed by <coughs> Councillor Lockenberg. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the great work. Um, my curiosity is around uh, stream, stream flow rates. Um, is there a matrix built into all this work where you're watching your, the stream flow rates as they rise, like say in a very heavy rain event? And then would there be a matrix where, you know, you'd hit a certain level of flow rate and and the warnings would go out to people and that that's built into this because I'm wondering like with the events we're having as of late last five years I mean it's um, the flow rates can be really uh, fast really quickly and I'm just wondering how is that built into this work so that we can give people enough warning or um, you know, if, if it's so, if it's going to skip the bank or th that kind of information. I don't know if I want to redirect this um, to emergency management. Maybe, John, if you want to call I'm not, I think it's more public works. So like, okay. Or John. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, so we don't. So, sorry. Um, John Dupolvic, yes. yes. emergency manager for City of Nelson. Correct, yes. Um, yeah, so thank you for the question. At the moment, there aren't, uh, we don't really have data that shows or a way that we can actually accurately track um, cubic meters or flow rates. So that's really where the importance of the visual inspections comes in. And uh, through, you know, performing those inspections, you know, oftentimes, um, multiple times during a day, overnight, uh, in periods with elevated risks, whether that's um, based on high stream flow advisories or um, an expected precipitation event. Uh, that, those are sort of our trigger points for um, activating and performing those assessments. So it's really at the moment based on um, what crews are seeing visually. And then from there, we can uh, you know, react and implement uh, emergency measures if required. Is this a supplemental? Sure can. Thank you. Uh, would there be a possibility of having like a piece of equipment or some way of, of, of watching in real time as, I'm, I, what I, why, I'm, why I'm asking this is because what's hap what happened in 2021 in BC and what's happening in California right now, uh, these, you know, our, our risk levels are being pushed to the limits uh, by these uh, rain events. So I, mean, I just feel this is such vital work for future safety of our town. I just wonder about kind of real-time information and giving people enough warning and having our departments, you know, um, be able to react as quickly as possible in these situations. Sure. So, I, I mean, there are instruments that can be um, 
built to measure flow rates, which is something we can definitely look into. Uh, we are fortunate in one way on Anderson Creek where there is a, uh, a river gauge that is owned by the province. So we do have access to real-time data, uh, real-time flow rate data on that particular creek. But um, I, ideally, it would, be, it would be nice to have gauges on all of the creeks so that we can um, you know, have a, a second way of monitoring. So um, definitely something we can look into. Thank you. So I just uh, note here that um, Chris has his hand up and perhaps could answer the technical aspect of that or some part I see he has a comment. So Thank you. Sure, thanks. I just wanted to uh, draw a connection between the emergency work here and the way that uh, we would typically think about disaster risk management across a range of pillars from the emergency preparedness and response were to some of the foundational activities, which are sometimes called mitigation and disaster risk management, to put in place the, the basic mapping. So that when one does these inspections or looks at the flow rates and thinks about it in real time, there's maps also available to say, okay, well, the flows are at this level, where is the water likely to go? To do some scenario planning in advance. And then ideally with that scenario planning in advance, put in place some response protocols too, so that the emergency response staff are all prepared so that when certain flow rates are triggered to be exceeded, there's a game plan in place informed by mapping that can help you know, communicate the extent of potential impact and also uh, next steps such as evacuation alerts and possibly uh, orders. Thank you, that's great, thank you. Councilor Lockover. Thank you, Mayor, through the chair. Um, so two questions, one really quick. The first is when we're ass assessing risk, I notice you're in your matrix there, the two, there was two components, both of them related to human infrastructure. Do you calculate in risk green infrastructure or just sort of ecosystems? I'm thinking in particular, like these are, some of them are fish bearing streams, like the risk to sort of natural systems, is that, something you consider when you calculate risk? I guess that's for mm. this. <clears throat> Thanks, and Laura can certainly speak to this one as, as well. Uh, the the short, short answer is yes, you can, and increasingly folks are. Um, and we're seeing that across the board, both in our work with municipal government and particularly in our work with uh, Indigenous communities that uh, may be concerned about a whole range of assets, including habitat and natural assets that are outside of what is traditionally being considered in the past. That said, no risk assessment can ever capture 100% of every possible scenario and every possible impact that could ever occur. Uh, what we normally start off with is the conversation to understand the key risks that the community cares about most and that are likely to just to drive the decisions and then we would focus on those and the risk management decisions that result from uh, being informed by key risks typically can mitigate a much broader range of risks then need to be explicitly quantified. And in doing so, we're able to quantitatively assess where we need to, for example, for life loss risk or maybe for economic loss, and semi-quantitatively or qualitatively address the exposure of other potential impacts that a community might care about, even sometimes in cases where you can't fully quantify that. Uh, and examples of that can be habitat impacts or impacts to fish bearing streams. Okay. Um, hopefully that's a starting point. Okay, well that's helpful. Um, then that leads to my second question, which is particularly with Ward Creek, um, right now you've sort of rated it as moderate to low risk. I'm wondering how, if in your sort of risk assess assessment, you consider future scenarios, like if there's a, a wildfire, burns out some of the, uh, the the watersheds for each of these creeks, and I'm particularly thinking about Ward in this case, and then the impact, the flood impact after that, 
given that the loss of, of storage capacity within that little watershed from the flood of, or from the fire event. So just in other words, let's say there's a 20% probability of a fire in the next five years. What impact would that have to the risk of uh, flood risk for that creek? If you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just two ways to, to think about that one. Um, a reactive way and a proactive way. Uh, in the reactive way, we're currently working on similar cases like that in the in the uh, Lickula River Valley near Merritt, which were part of the Lytton fire above the city of Lytton as well, and a host of other cases where the watershed is burned and folks are forced to respond and understand the risks. And in those cases, it, it really does start at the beginning and you're looking at the watershed, looking at the fan and, and doing a, a hazard and a risk assessment uh, where the hazard for a period of two to five up to 10 years afterwards is much higher than the baseline. In a case like this, if you already laid out the baseline, uh, you're much further ahead. You can start to ask, what if scenarios? What if the watershed burns? Uh, what is that likely to look like? And then uh, get prepared in advance so that you're at least partway through a post wildfire risk assessment before the fire occurs. Um, so that is one thing that Nelson might think, might wish to think about for a case like Ward Creek, where it's true, uh, a, a wildfire in that basin would, would change the game in terms of the level of hazard for a period of time. I don't know, Lauren, if you have any other comments on that one. Yeah, I would just add that the um, <clears throat> we're fortunate in BC that the BC Wildfire Service has done uh, future burn probability forecasting. And we will, in our more detailed assessments, we will leverage that and think about the <clears throat> what's been mapped as the future probability of burn within the area of interest. And then lay on to that, what's the probability of a certain flood magnitude, debris flood or debris flood met flow magnitude and bring those two together as one of the scenarios or a number of the scenarios that we consider in the detailed hazard assessment. Great, thanks. Other questions from councillors? Uh, Councillor um, Tate, then Councillor Payne. That wasn't a question, that was uh, moving my hand. What? Thanks. That wasn't a question. Oh, did you lift up your... I lifted up my glasses and moved them over there. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you lifted up the flag and we need a definition. No, no, no. no. We're, Sorry. We're, we're good. Tate. Thank you, Mayor. Um, do I understand correctly that uh, with the next steps in the application for grant funding that the grant would cover the associated costs for the Anderson Creek hazard assessment only? Just the first creek only? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Also, Paige. I have a tiny question. Many of the no, you don't. my question was tiny and it got a nod. <laughs> many of the questions have already been asked and, and we obviously had a workshop with you guys earlier, so uh, thank you for this report. The GIS data that you've compiled and made available for us online, is that something that can be exported and provided to the RDCK to be integrated into their broader GIS system for the area? Yes, absolutely. So uh, the idea is to try to maintain a consistent source of knowledge provided to the RCK for use in their systems. Uh, we would just add that uh, some of the ways that these data are managed and presented online uh, take some IT infrastructure. And uh, we've been speaking with Crystal and her team at the RDCK as to how this can be maintained in a kind of more of a living way over time with Nelson and other communities uh, needing to maintain and update it on a relatively frequent basis. Um, so yes to the GIS files, although I will also say that we're trying to figure out, there's, there are more, there are different means to serve data today than there have been in the past beyond uh, FTP site download type approaches for data management. Uh, but yes, the data is always made available. Okay, thank you. And it has already been shared with Nelson, so it, it's it's your data, and you're you're welcome to share it as appropriate as well. Okay, I do have. Okay, something. now she's got one. Okay, I couldn't believe that we we're going to go without a question. 
Um, I don't know that this is a question as much as a comment. I just want to share uh, with everyone out there that when Council first saw this information, it was um, quite, um, I don't know, disconcerting. Um, it was a, a scenario that we weren't jumping up and down about going, well, look at what we get to handle here. But I think it's really important to focus on the opportunity that through an interesting situation, this came forward so that we can be proactive around it um, before we have witnessed any, I'm right, we haven't witnessed any serious repercussions from this yet. So I think that we're in a good place with our plans, development services, um, climate mitigation, public works, to address these situations before we run into any scenarios that are more in the uh, emergency operations ballpark. So as much as it is a, a big bite to swallow, uh, it is an opportunity to be proactive and do the work that needs to be done. So I'm very happy that we're there. And thanks to all who were involved in bringing that forward to us and the great work that's been done here. More work to be done, obviously. Councillor Page. Yeah, this one is, thanks, Mayor. This is uh, to staff. So we see in the report the work plan calls for the development of a creek inspection policy to guide uh, when and where and how we go and take a look at things. Uh, I'm aware of at least one resident who has expressed concerns about their property adjacent to Anderson Creek, and I wonder what the timeline might be for the development of that policy and whether their request to have look have, have a look at the infrastructure that currently contains that creek near their property will wait behind that policy development or? Yes, it's an interesting question. So, so right now, uh, Public Works inspects the creeks already. Right. And they do it during freshhead or heavy rainfall when they know there could potentially be a problem. I don't know if Colin wants to jump in here. Um, and, um, but we're, we're saying, well, let's put it in a core council policy and have council adopt that officially, make that an official policy. And then the second piece along Anderson Creek, and it is kind of problematic, as I understand uh, from the uh, city engineer, is that um, the creek goes along the back of some people's property and there's no public access mm. um, or statutory right of ways to gain mm. access to the creek so it becomes challenging and has been difficult for us to review or manage over the years but we've done our best not everybody is um, keen to have staff going through their property but um, if the um, concern is directed to public works we can at least explore it okay Councillor Wood. Thank you. Uh, drones? Drones? Yes, we can use drones. I, I, don't, I don't think Water we have drones. a drone anymore. <laughs> um, I heard we used to have a drone. You could probably look at the condition of the creek, but if you needed to make any improvements, you'd need to get permission from private landowners to go on their property. I think that becomes problematic. Just thinking of a you know, quick assessment tool. If, if say, we had a big rain event that might be a option uh, just to have some piece of technology like that on on hand sorry I had a... okay sorry Back we're going we're going there we're doing this Councillor page <laughs> with 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 your permission mayor in the car I guess this is more to the administration staff but it, with the statutory right of ways potentially not having been secured because of a historical context. We had already put forward to the province a request to look at our hydro-specific statutory right of ways. Are we considering adding this type of statutory right of way to that same kind of request to try and bring, yeah, okay, I'm seeing lots of nodding, so question answered. Thank you. Any Further questions? I want to thank Natalie. I'd like to thank Chris Holm and Lauren Hutchinson for from um, BGC for coming in and doing a great 
presentation. Um, as Councillor um, Payne suggested, this is a really, um, there's lots to sink your teeth into on this. I think you did a great presentation that, that I felt uh, a majority of people are gonna under, understand it and not be, I mean, it's a concern, but uh, none of us are gonna start heading, heading for um, Saskatchewan <laughs> to be away from steep creeks and ravines anytime soon. And uh, thank you for calling Innocent behind there, like nodding his head up and down as the public works engineer to some of the questions that were asked around the table. So um, seeing so there's no further questions, uh, we have a recommendation in front of us. Is there a mover of the recommendation? Councillor Woodward, seconded by Councillor Tate. Councillor Woodward, if you would like to read the recommendation. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, whereas Council accepts the Steep Creek Assessment Report as information and whereas council supports a staff recommendation to conduct detailed hazard mapping for Anderson Creek, Fell Creek, and to produce uh, or and to proceed with the creation of a framework for planning and development policies with respect to geohazard risk and climate adaptation. Therefore, be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Nelson be authorized to apply the to apply the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund, CEPF under the disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation, DRRCA, for both category one and two, up to the grant maximum of $150,000 per category, and further that if the grant applications are successful, that staff be directed to amend the five-year financial plan accordingly, and finally, that staff be responsible for overall grant management. So that, uh Recommendation resolution has been moved and it has been seconded. Any further discussion, Council? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion in front of us, that is moved and carried. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Chris and Lauren, and look forward to doing, um, no doubt, future work with you um, after we secure these grants. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Thank you, Natalie. Council. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh, oh. There go. Oh. All of our Thanks, all, all of our all of our gallery is leaving. Thanks, everybody. Hi guys. <laughs> okay. The next item of business is uh, item B, and that is twenty the twenty two twenty three COVID recovery grant program. For council direction, staff have been working to initiate a second phase of the COVID recovery grant program. The program would accept applications through the end of January and the beginning of February. Subsequently, in late February or early March, Council would be asked to review a staff recommendation regarding awards under the program. So, we have a recommendation in front of us. And so moved. So moved. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and it's been seconded. Okay, and so I will ask the mover to read the first of the resolutions. The council directs staff to conduct a 2023 COVID recovery program as outlined in the program guidelines and report back to council with a recommendation for awards. Okay, and that's been seconded by Councillor Lockenberg. And any discussion? Councillor Lockenberg. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, Sarah or Chris, who would I be asking? Well, either one. Not staff. Okay. Staff. One of the two. Um, so, uh, first question, and, and I might offer an amendment depending on, on the answer here. The first is the um, uh, organizations that are eligible to receive up to 50% of lost revenue. Um, just to be clear, I, I'm not to call them out, but I'm, I'm thinking about the Civic Theater Society in this case. Um, are is it 50% of lost revenue over the entire pandemic or what's the time frame here? Are we talking two years? Could it be as much as three? Or is it just per year? What's the... Yeah, that's a fair point. I don't know that we specified in here um, sort of the time frame that we were looking at. Um, Can I offer Yep, something? sure. Yep. Well, we did, we did a first intake in yeah. 2021 okay. and we based it on on the a impact year. of COVID at that time. Okay. So that would have been one year. One year. Right? Yeah. 2020. And then uh, 
part of 2021 until we did the grant. Yeah. Which I think was June. So it would be the same sort of like from then, I would think from then, because if, if, if groups can apply for a second round of funding, um, that would make sense. Yeah. So you're, you're fully eligible to apply in this round. If you received funds in the first round, we wouldn't want to double up on any of the, um, granting. Like if you would, um, you know, count the same lost revenue twice, if that makes sense. But I think it would make sense that we are looking at sort of that, you know, 2020, if your fiscal year is 2022, January to December, we'd be looking at that kind of period there. Yeah. Would make sense to me. Okay. So, so my question, potential amendment, and I'll just put this out, uh, before I go through the process of offering an amendment here, is um, given the, the fairly restrictive criteria here, it seems to me, especially that we're talking about 50% of revenue, and some nonprofits actually did better on the revenue side. A lot of them were grant funded, got all sorts of revenue supports. So many organizations would be immediately disqualified. But if we could narrow the definition of revenue to, let's say, ticket sales, and then that might you know, sort of put maybe just a few, like the capital and the civic into this bucket, for, I'm guessing, then the $25,000 limit doesn't, especially given 50% of lost revenue, if the amendment I would offer would be 100% of lost revenue. So that's not 100% of revenue, just whatever they might have lost over COVID. In the case of civic and capital, it was pretty significant. Like they legally couldn't open their doors for a long stretch of time. They may be the only organizations that really qualify. And given the total amount, then we're not, we're essentially not spending the money. Like there'll be a lot left over. And, and, and I think they both need it and really benefit from it. And so just thinking of those two organizations in particular, I'd mm. love to bump the 50% to 100%. And I'd love to bump, bump the twenty-five thousand dollar cap to something like fifty. Um, so maybe I'll just go ahead and offer the amendment so we can discuss it. Um, I'd love to hear feedback. So, if I may, can I? Am, it's kind of tough because it's kind of embedded into the staff recommendation. So, with the change to the staff recommendation, fifty thousand cap. And 100% of lost revenue. Is, can, can, yeah. I'm just wondering if we can actually, like, can we make amendments? Like, do you want the program? Can, mm -hmm. can we decide that first question? And then once you vote on whether or not you even want a grant program, you can you can put a resolution on the floor that says I would like. Sure. Okay. That Does that fair? Yeah. Because that it's draft, great. it just says as outlined. No, no, that's it's the next draft. motion. Yeah. All right. So we can just. Okay. Uh, okay. As outlined in the program guide. Okay. With, if we did it as an amendment. So can we change the program guide? With the amendment okay. to the guideline okay. of. You could make a friendly amendment so that it just says take out um, as outlined in the program guidelines just take that out. that's your friendly amendment okay and then you can say I would like some a, a, um, a resolution on the table to that mm -hmm. that's so, the friendly that's amendment so, so it would so it would just be that council direct city staff to conduct the 2023 COVID recovery program period period and report back to council with a recommendation for period. awards Okay. Okay. That's the, the friendly amendment is just to cross out. And then what you want is another resolution yeah. that pertains to what the program guidelines should be. Yeah. Can I comment a little bit just on the, sure. the thoughts here? Um, so first thing, you know, it was definitely more of an issue in that first immediate post-pandemic period where there were a lot of grant funds out there and, and I totally recognize that some groups actually did better post-COVID because they received all of this one-time funding. For the most part, I think that's pretty much 
dried up, that we're not seeing those those grant funds come in anymore, especially if we're looking at, say, 2022, where there isn't any of that sort of one-time funding. Second, in the eligibility criteria, we do say um, demonstrate a loss of earned revenue. And that was always my intent, is that it's, um, like you said, ticket okay. sales. It's yep. earned revenue. So, you know, if we're talking about 50% of earned revenue as opposed to total revenue. Um, the third point, the 25000 cap, was really just, you know, if you say 50000 it's, you know, four groups could eat up the whole thing. So then it's just not available to as wide a, a group. So those are just kind of my thoughts on that. Councillor Payne. Um, just one question, CFO Jerry. My understanding from the CDC that was that Joyce Barrett was going to contribute to the criteria. Did that happen? Um, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. I mean, they would have uh, seen this criteria, the program. Um, I did not give it to them. Um, this is the pretty much the same program that we ran in the first okay. round. Just, I, I just know it was in the minutes from the last CDC, so I didn't follow up with Joy because that was there, but that's um, something I can do. Um, and then I guess not having been here for the first round, uh, thank you for sending us the list of who did get the disbursements from the first time. How much was available in the first dispersal? Yes, I think we had 300,000 set aside. And then and we it was... didn't disperse at all? No. So if we make it 50 mm -hmm. um, and we get more applicants than the uh, 200 that's left, that can be scaled back on a percentage basis, couldn't it? It's easier to scale it back because my thought is that we have this COVID response funding we know there are uh, entities out there in the community that need the money. We need to give them a vehicle where they can access those funds in the way I think mm -hmm. Rick, uh, Councillor Lochtenberg, has uh, an interesting point there. I just, I just want to caution on, I mean, I, whatever council decides and 50 sounds like a good number, the um, looking back to, um, having having been here when we did it the last time, is that the limit was um, fifteen thousand because we thought there would be a a significant um, intake, and a lot of people did their whole program based on the fifteen. So, you know, there there is you do run the risk that four people would meet all the criteria and be asking for the whole fifty. Like so, just it, it's it's a one of those cautionary tales because people will see that some people which surprised me that I know, know needed a lot more money, just kind of carved off, well, we want to do this, and we need $9,867.14 to do X, which just really surprised me in the, in the, in the first round. And I think that, I think just, we just need to be um, careful in terms of, of saying 50, and then you saying, well, if, if then 20 people apply, then we then lessen everybody's, because they might actually be, thinking I have a really good chance of getting 50 I'm meeting all the criteria but now you're only going to give me 25 so just just a cautionary tale but whatever council um, likes to decide councillor Woodward thank you mayor uh, I would just uh, track along the same line as the mayor in the sense that personally I would rather see the disbursements go out to a wider range of organizations than just a few um, so that would be my only caution. And can I just say one thing? There's no reason why if it stays at 25,000 and there are, it's not used up, that we can't come back to council and, and increase the amount. It's easier so to increase the amount than it is to decrease the amount. No. Good, good point. Okay, thanks. Councillor Panero, because he hasn't spoken yet, and then uh, Councillor Lockerberg. So, uh, yeah, having missed the first round, but I'm assuming that there's only so many associations in town that sort of fit the bill, and, and so we may very well have people applying again for a second round of funding. And just to, I think it would be a good idea, I like what Councillor Lochtenberg has, has suggested about revenue. Um, 
what that means because I think in the case of the theater, for example, what you're dealing with now is not so much COVID, but the knock-on effects of COVID and the habits that were formed during COVID mm. and, and these things continue to have an effect on some businesses, right? Mm. Um, but I think we do need to somehow be, you know, I don't think we should be giving people funding twice for the same deficit. Like, we should bookend that funding. Like, if you were, you you know, your, your section was 2020 to 2021 and you've been compensated for that and now what have you lost since then? Yeah. Um, so just to make sure that that's part of the conversation as well. And, and but also, yeah, and, and I like it and to recognize the fact that, you know, while COVID itself is sort of maybe not the thing it was, then the knock-on effects for some people are going to be, continue to be a, a major a major thing in their existence. So, um, yeah, just to make sure that we're kind of bookending funding, not just a blank check once more. Locker. But just <clears throat> clarify that w what I was anticipating is that given the criteria, there wouldn't be a lot of organizations that qualified. There might only be two, in which case, if we've limited it, then we don't spend the 200000 We have yet, we, we only can distribute 50000 leaving 150000 not being put to work when it could be really helping an organization that desperately needs it as opposed to saying, yeah, we'll come back next year and distribute the rest. But but if, as um, Sarah is saying, that you would bring it back, if, if we don't max out the 200,000, then we can maybe offer a second round or something yeah. like that. If, if, you take a, if you take a look at the second resolution, hmm. which is um, that you direct staff to include $200,000 in the budget for this program, mm -hmm. um, the money is there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it would just be a matter of, I mean, staff will see the um, applications mm -hmm. and finance staff will go through them like like they did last time and prioritize. And so if there is not enough, not enough applicants to use up all the funding, but some of the applicants that did apply need more funding, mm -hmm. the money is in the budget. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Thanks. <coughs> Councillor um, Page and then <coughs> Councillor Payne. Um, I'm sure it's in the report and perhaps I've just missed it, but my recollection on the COVID funding was there was a spend requirement by the end of 2023, perhaps like it, it's in, originally when we received this money, I believe there was a, we no. must spend it by. No, there was no, um, no end date designated. Now I, you, you might be thinking of regional districts. Regional district had an end they date. They had a. They had an end date that they had to either okay. spend it or allocate it, you know, in their budgets by a certain date. But there wasn't anything for municipalities, um, okay. so yeah, probably. <laughs> and we are, and we are in the cost and budget impacts. We are adding actually another um, fifty thousand over what was actually residual in the okay. COVID monies that we had um, set aside um, initially. So okay. we've added a little bit more. Um, that isn't necessarily COVID relief really money itself. So great, thank you. On the reduction, the the re okay. 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 So we've had a mover and seconder for the friendly the the friendlyly amended motion. The council directs city staff to conduct the 2023 COVID recovery program and report back to council with a recommendation for awards. I'm, I'm a little bit unsure. I'm sorry of where we are. Right now. Where we are. In the so I'm just looking at staff recommendation number one. Yeah. Which was moved and seconded. And right. then during discussion, there was the thought that it should be amended. But... Staff have advised us that amendment could be just friendly, so we don't have to have a vote on an amendment, and then if everybody's happy with it being friendly, and we will just delete this line that says outlined in the program guidelines. Okay. So we're voting on that. That would be what we're voting on, just the first um, resolution of the staff recommendations, number one. 
I can read it again. Sure. The council direct city staff to conduct the 2023 COVID recovery program and report back to council with a recommendation for awards. So basically they'd come back with the list of who, who made the criteria. Okay. Based on at this point, $25,000 is what I hear is the number. Is everybody okay with that? All those in favor? Okay, it's been moved, seconded and carried. And then, so, Councillor Lockenburn, would you like to have a resolution regarding, um, <clears throat> so? Uh, well, if, if or do you feel that staff no, has enough information? I think they have enough information. Yeah. Okay. But I can. I, you don't have to. I would want you to tell me again. Okay. If I were, which I don't personally feel like I need to, I, I we could just leave it at this and move on. Okay. But if you'd like, or if the council would like, I could move to put those caps back in. Oh, I see. So you're comfortable with what we talked about? Yeah, because it'll come back to us yes. anyways, yeah. and yes. then we can adjust okay. at, around the table as we okay. see fit. And I think that... We've had the discussion and I think staff now <clears throat> knows that, you know, we're not going back. You don't get to go back to March of 2020 and start adding up all of your losses. So we're going to start from where we had the last program. We're going to go forward as Councillor Panero wanted to have. We're doing 25. We're going to look and see what comes back. So we're going to flow out with pretty much the same program. We've upped the money. We've got 200000 Councillor Page. I would warn against, uh, like, what I, what I see that we've done is we've removed, removed the prescriptive nature of it by not necessarily referencing the exact policy as drafted, right? Like, we're going to do a program, but we no longer as outlined in the program guides, which gives staff some flexibility. That's what I heard. Um, but I would warn against just bookending completely for the example or scenario of a uh, organization that comes forward that maybe perhaps didn't come forward the last time but yeah. they're suffering from a hole from the first time so like i, I want staff to have that, that flexibility before, basically yeah. you can't you can't if you already got the money once you, okay. you've got to start again so okay just yeah. to be clear i just yeah. I, I want staff and finance staff to have that flexibility to make those staff calls. Is you, you you're comfortable yeah. with that yeah i mean we have the the all the applications and and backup and everything from the first round so we would know what we was included in that first application and we would make sure we're not stretching over that whole period okay. yep and and to staff i would not again maybe this would require a discussion of council but that 50 percent thing like to me that seems a bit arbitrary when it might be 100 percent would be fine for some organizations in which it's really critical like i, I just don't think we, we need to put those arbitrary limits just have it come forward and then council can kind of assess them across the board against their 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 real needs their genuine needs as opposed to an arbitrary cap that's my yeah we, recommendation we could remove the i mean we just you know maximum about twenty five thousand um eligible you know to um, offset lost revenue, but don't, you know, specify a spe specific percentage. That mm -hmm. would make sense, yeah. 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 Councillor Payne, you look like you're half up, half down with the hand. I'm up <laughs> this time for sure. I'll leave the glasses there. Um, I'm just interested to know how many applicants did not qualify last time. Nine. Were there many people half, that... Half of them, I don't think. I think there half was 18 them. applicants okay. and nine of them. Yeah, it's... I did see the list. It, I would say it's about yeah, about half. Yeah. It said that in the package. It's in the. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It was that. in the. It was in the request that you actually had. So I read. No, that your, I have. Oh, I just looked request. at the ones who got it. Yeah. Sorry. Eighteen yeah. applicants. Nine down. were awarded. Yep. Yeah. Thank so you. it was fifty percent of them didn't. Any further questions? And we'll try to move on to the staff recommendation number two pertaining to that in regards to the total amount of money that's available. Moved by Councillor Page and seconded by Councillor Woodward. Councillor Page. 
the council directs staff to include the two hundred thousand include the two hundred thousand dollar budget for the program in the 2023-2027 five-year financial plan to be funded from the COVID-19 province of BC Restart Grant. And that's been seconded by Councillor Woodward. Any discussion on that? <clears throat> Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the resolution? That's been moved and carried. Okay, thank you very much. And moving on to item number uh, 14. Information items, we have some uh, minutes in front of us from the Nelson uh, Public Library and the Cultural Development uh, Committee. Uh, is there any councillors that want to comment on that or bring forward any bits of information that need um, highlighting? Seeing none. Uh, if we could have a motion, please. Councillor Tate, seconded by Councillor Woodward. Councillor Tate, you have it there to read? Yep. Okay. That council received the committee and commission meeting minutes for information. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Moving on to the uh, reports. Item B, we have in front of us the finance uh, report for November to November the 30th and development services building permit statistics. Any <coughs> comments, concerns? Anybody have any accounts they have questions about? And just a reminder, if you do have, um, when you review that, uh, any concerns about any of the accounts payables listing, if you can try in in front of the meeting to send those requests to uh, CFO jury, because oftentimes they're 10 or 15 pages long and he doesn't necessarily always have the answer to the question to put him on the spot in a council meeting. <laughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so 2021, 2022, uh, number of permits, and value. So 2021, 231 permits with 34 million 300. And 2022, 176 permits with a value of 75 million 236. So I'm just wondering, it's less permits, but far more value. Is that because of the bigger projects? That would be my Says guess, yeah. yeah. That, that would be some of the bigger projects that have come through with their building permits. Okay. You had half a development service this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should have kept one of them. That's okay. I, I was, that's what I was thinking. It was that it was larger, the larger units being built. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at some of the big projects that are happening on the go or just started, right? Right. Just over here in Vernon Street and the Health Campus and all those things. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's still amazing. These statistics are it's incredible. Absolutely incredible, exactly, exactly. We need to have... Um, build, baby, build. We need to uh, have some kind of uh, maybe graphical representation that shows 10 years. It would be, it would be interesting to see a graph that it shows 10 years so you could just, just see the, mm -hmm. the, the difference. Maybe that will be something that we can ask for. You know, because they've got a lot of extra time. <laughs> <laughs> But I like, I like that get graphical thing. And we only get to see, you know, we, we do 20, 2021, 2022. We know that the last, you know, three to five years have, they, they, we've been really churning out the uh, permits. But May. I think if we looked at 10 years, it would be interesting to see. Councillor Page. It's a lovely thought. Uh, but one thing I want to bring forward just from the uh, conversation we had with Nicola today at the RDCK was the systemic underbuilding that's happened in this country over the last 30 years, which they demonstrated uh, with some graphs showing the, uh, the tens of thousands of social units that were put in place in the 70s and 80s dropping down to practically nil from the 90s onward. And an as much as an interesting met metric relative to what we have been building and that we are building more, I would want to see such a, such a representation include an understanding of where we should be, which when I do my back of the paper napkins shows us still well behind meeting or addressing 
uh, or even making progress against the population growth in the community uh, towards the actual just systemic um, constriction we've had in supply. So mm -hmm. I just that's just my thought that comes from from that representation is to make sure it's where, where are we building towards? What, what, what should we be building? How many units a year is enough to kind of take the pressure off our community in terms of the vacancy and, and the housing affordability struggles? But I just... Um. No, and you know, Mikola does good work, and I, and not to put any um, pressure on uh, Councillor Lautenberg, but now that we have are putting his name for it for a potential seat at the FCM, the is that one of the things that he can um, <laughs> continue to lobby for there is uh, the downturn in housing build, um, building we all know is very clearly demarcated by the end of um, federal in incentives to build uh, rental it's housing stock, out. which. Uh, ended in the 70s and since then we haven't seen any rental stock really mm -hmm. built so we yep. can draw a line in the sand exactly mm -hmm. when there was uh, a, a turn in uh, yep. sort of for affordable I don't like to use that word because now the, the definition of that word has changed so much but in terms of non-market and and rental housing um, there's a there's a clear line in the sand mm -hmm. um, Councillor Payne you had your hand up that was just the comment that I wanted to ask. It's not the quantity that we're building. It's the type of non-market housing to fit each segment of the economy. So numbers aren't, number of units isn't the full story, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's into which segment in the housing needs assessment gives us a lot of that information. Sure. So could I have a motion? I'll move that. That's uh, moved by Councillor Woodward, seconded by... Councillor Page, Councillor Woodward, you could read the recommendation, please. Um, the council received the reports presented by staff in, for information. Thank you. All those in favor? And that's carried. Um, there's no uh, notice of motion. The late item we had, uh, we discussed that as item seven and a half. And our last motion there is number 17 in camera release to the public. We actually have something to release to the public. Mm -hmm. And that is from Council's December the 6th, 2022 in camera meeting that Council reappoint Dale Butterfield and Michelle Sylvest to the Nelson Public Library Board for two year term expiring on December 31st, 2024. Mm -hmm. And that Council appoints, and further the Council appoints Sue Adam and Leslie Garlow to the Nelson Public Library Board for a two year term expiring on December 31st, 2024. And finally, that the above motion be released to the public. Um, I'll move, is there a seconder? Councilor Panero, all those in favor? And that's moved and carried. Uh, item 18, resolution to adjourn, is there a mover? Councilor Lockenberg, seconded by Councilor Payne, all those in favor, and thank you. Thank you, Mayor. First uh, go around with our new procedure and uh, thank you everybody and once again happy new year and thank you to those in the audience that stayed for the full meeting. Look forward to seeing you all on the 31st at 4.30 for 